I will do so. One sec. Welcome. My name is Kent Rissmiller. I'm the Dean of the Global School at WPI, and it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this event this afternoon. Um, this is a once in a year happening for us. It's slightly delayed from last year, but we're very happy to get here. We're well, very pleased to be able to share, you know, in this medium, the work of our students at project centers and, at, and in Worcester uh, last year. Uh, to begin, I want to share some information and introduce President Leshen uh, from WPI. Lori Leshen is our 16th president, the first woman to lead Worcester Polytechnic Institute, the nation's third oldest private engineering technological university. Under her leadership, WPI has steadily built upon its reputation as a global leader in project-based learning and was recognized by the Wall Street Journal rankings for the university best able to balance excellence in teaching with groundbreaking research. President Leshen has prioritized diversity, equity, and inclusion and w at WPI, and we are now among the STEM institutions with the highest percentage of female undergraduates. She's also a champion of K-12 STEM outreach and serves on the federal STEM advisory panel charged with advising federal agencies on their implementation of STEM initiatives. And she more recently has served as the only representative from higher education on the governor's corona pandemic State Reopening Advisory Board. Prior to joining WPI, President Leshen was an accomplished leader in academics and government service with roles including at the Dean of the School of Science at RPI and as a scientist for the Mars Curiosity Rover Mission, Deputy Director of NASA's Exploration System Missions Directorate, where she oversaw NASA's future human spaceflight programs. She also serves in leadership positions for many academic and science-focused organizations beyond WPI. Welcome, Dr. Leshen. Thank you, uh, Dean Rissmiller. I appreciate it. Um, and just a few quick comments for the group. I'm just, I'm, this is literally one of my most favorite days of the year, every single year. I absolutely love uh, the opportunity to be with all of our incredible student teams and to uh, to learn more about your projects. I will say from the outset, you are all winners. Just being a finalist in the President's IQP Award is, is just an amazing accomplishment. So huge congratulations to all of the students on all of the teams who are here of the hundreds of projects and probably, well, hundreds and hundreds of IQPs that we do each and every year to know that you're in the top five is, is truly incredible. Um, this day means so much to me, not only because it's a day to celebrate the accomplishments of our students, but, but because it's a day that's really all about who we are at WPI. When you ask, why is it that we do what we do here? To me, there are three reasons that, that we exist, three reasons we do what we do, and three aspirations that we have. The first is about transforming lives. It's about equipping our students with the skills and capabilities to make a difference in the world and to, to transform their lives for the better through the education uh, they receive at WPI, they engage in at WPI. Um, the second one is all about translating knowledge to impact and action. It's not, we know a lot. Using that knowledge to make, great, to make change in the world is a, is a set of skills that have to be learned and have to be practiced. And so, you know, we wanna solve big problems whether that's you know about the environment or um, you know, medical science or you know, make, reducing human suffering, increasing food security, whatever it might be that we're passionate about, figuring out how we translate knowledge to impact is another big reason for what we do. And then the third is all about revolutionizing STEM education. You know, STEM education has super too often been um, huddled in the lab and for the elite few, and we believe that's. STEM can be for everyone and needs to be in every community everywhere. And so these are all things that we believe in at WPI and there is no greater um, way of bringing those aspirations to life than the IQP. The IQP is designed to hit on all three of those reasons for being. And so I'm excited today to hear from our student teams about how their work has impacted them personally, how it has helped them learn how to help lift up communities and, and how it's gonna be a part of their lives going forward. And we know based on decades of experience with this kind of work that these projects do 
stay with our students and stay with the communities they work in for decades. So again, huge congratulations to all of the teams. I'm so proud of you and I cannot wait to hear from you and I'm looking forward to today. So thanks again and back to you, Dean Rice Miller. Thank you, President Washington. At this point, I want to introduce the other four judges who are joining us today in this program. First is Mark Whitley, who is a graduate of UPI in chemical engineering in the class of 1973. He received a master's degree from the University of Kentucky, uh, where he conducted research on desulfurizing coal gas. Uh, at the end of his graduate studies, Mark took a position with Shell Oil Company in New Orleans operations and gained exposure to fracking. Since that day, he's become widely known for revolutionizing the energy industry with the application of hydrofracking technology to shale formations. In 1982, Mark took an engineering position at Mitchell Energy Corporation and worked through that organization to be a team leader in engineering. We moved to Fort Worth, Texas in 1997 to lead the engineering division that perfected the use of water fracking uh, in the Barnett Shale formation. And he joined Range Resources in 2005 to start its Barnett Shale activity and later to evaluate and develop the Marcellus Shale. Um, in 2012, Mark left Range uh, and joined Warburg Pincus, serving on the boards of three of its startup companies. He also held the role of President and Chief Executive Officer at Chisholm Energy Holdings, a startup company headquartered in Fort Worth until his retirement in the fall of 2020. Cola Akindeli is the new Assistant Vice President for External Relations and Strategic Partnerships at WPI. In this role, Cola oversees corporate, foundation, community, and government relations for us. He's a seasoned external affairs professional with experience engaging policymakers and advising organizational decision makers on regulatory and legislative matters. Prior to coming to WPI, he served at UMass Medical School as a Senior Director of Community and Government Relations, and then as an Assistant Vice Chancellor. Prior to that, he served in Community and Government Relations at Hartford Healthcare. In addition to holding a BA in Economics and Politics from UMass Boston, Cola received his JD from Northeastern University and a Master's in Health Informatics and Management from the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. He's also an adjunct faculty member for health policy at Worcester State University. And our last judge, not our last judge, two judges more, Jeremy Hitchcock, graduated from WPI in 2004 with a degree in management information systems. But before that, in 2001, he founded Dyne in his dorm room. Dyne developed a number of internet infrastructure systems and products and grew to a company of over 500 employees and over 100 million uh, annual revenues. He left Dyne in 2016 and it was acquired by Oracle the following year. Um, Jeremy then focused on a new company called Minim, an AI driven Wi Fi management and Internet of Things security platform for service providers. His work, his work has earned him numerous awards, including recognition as a 2016 Ernst and Young Entrepreneur of the Year finalist and of other lists like Deloitte's Fast 500 Rankings and Inc. Magazine's Top 500. He's also received an honorary doctorate from the University System of New Hampshire and from Riviera University for his effort on workforce and economic development. Most recently, University of New Hampshire recognized him as the 2019 Holloway Entrepreneur of the Year. Jeremy and his work have been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Forbes Magazine, and the Boston Globe, among other national publications. He serves on the Board of Trustees at WPI now and was formerly on the board of the Community College System of New Hampshire. And Reverend Deborah Jackson. Reverend Jackson joined WPI as the Dean of the Foise Business School just this January, but she's not new to WPI as she's earned two master's degrees from us, one in management and one in manufacturing engineering. Deborah first earned her bachelor's degree in information systems and operations management at Indiana University and worked for 20 years in software engineering, including positions at, as CIO and COO of Smart Energy and as a director on several corporate boards. In 2000, Deborah began studies at Andover Newton Theological Seminary, where she earned a master's in divinity and a doctorate in ministry and leadership. She served the First Baptist Church of Newton for eight years 
and also as the director of the Minister's Council of the American Baptist Church. In 2017, she joined Yale Divinity School as a director for lifelong learning and has served most recently as a director of operations for a nonprofit, All Girls Allowed. Dr. Jackson is the author of two books, Spiritual Practices for Effective Leadership and Meant for Good, Fundamentals of Womanist Leadership. She serves on the WPI Board of Trustees from 2012 until 2020, and in 2019 was inducted into WPI's Hall of Lumen. I want to thank all of the judges for their time today, and in fact, they put in time already in preparing for this day, and I thank you for that as well. I have a couple other comments before we get started with the students' presentations. Um, first, an acknowledgement here. Um, this competition is open to all the students who completed projects in their junior year, which was 2019-20. And 60 different teams of students decided to enter the competition this year. Uh, there are only five before you today, and that's because we've had the hard work of a screening panel of professors who read through the 60 entries and narrowed the list down to these five. I want to thank those faculty members for that work. It's very important to us. They are Parik Okana, Crystal Brown, Wenwa Du, and Holger, Dress Holger Dressler. Um, they put in a lot of hours last fall uh, to get us to this point. In addition, the screening panel wanted to recognize a sixth student team uh, for work on their project, um, and they're receiving an honorable mention. Normally, this is printed in your program, but you're going to have to rely on me for this this time. Those students are Peyton Bielowski, Nathan Kaplan, Brian Price, Alyssa Souza, and Rebecca Vernon. They did a project called Developing Sustainability Plan for Hamas in Morocco. And their advisors were Professor Mohammed El Hamzawi and Laura Roberts. So congratulations to them as well. At this point, I want to share the program. Let's see that I can do that um, for the afternoon. This is on the WPI web pages as well. And give you a little bit of an overview of what's happening here. Um, we're just ending the welcome address, and we'll have the first presentation at 1.45. Um, you can see, I can get over here, that the presentations are scheduled to be roughly uh, 20 minutes of student presentation with 10 minutes of question and answer. So they go for about half an hour for each team. After the first three presentations, We'll have a break at 3.15 for 15 minutes, and then the final two presentations. Um, because we've published this schedule, and we know there are people who come in to hear particular student team presentations, I, I will not start them early. Uh, we'll try to start each one on time and end on time, and, and that will be sort of my role. Um, at 4.30, we'll be finished with the presentations. We will give the judges a chance to meet in a separate room to deliberate, and then they will come back uh, to join everyone in the, in the uh, webinar uh, to announce their decisions. One final comment from me. Um, I tried to stay out of the way at this event. I'd much rather hear from the students. Last year, when we started this program, I mentioned that it was we were recognizing the 50th anniversary of the WPI plan. And the WPI plan adopted project-based learning for the university and included the, the founding ideas around the interactive qualifying project to give all of our primarily science and engineering students one significant experience at this intersection of human need, social interest, and science and engineering. And that's what I think we'll hear from all of these students today. The IQP program has obviously developed over many years into a tremendously unique and significant global projects program. And so we have students who worked in Costa Rica and in Albania and in Worcester um, and, and in London uh, on these projects. And of course, a lot has changed since last, since last year. In fact, uh, I think it's, it was a year ago yesterday that we made the decision to suspend travel to these project centers for this academic year. 
What we didn't do was suspend projects and suspend student work on projects. And when we were unable to travel, we had a lot of upset people who thought we shouldn't bother doing projects. But I think what we've learned over this past year is that we do projects. We can do them in person, we can do them remotely, we can do them with effective teams, we can do them with highly motivated students and a very engaged faculty set of advisors and center directors. And I think that's what you'll be able to see today. Most of these students were able to travel, but nevertheless, some of them weren't, and projects continued and our work continued. Uh, and we've seen great evidence of that over the past year. So without more, it is 1.45. I want to turn over to the first team, which will present on assessing opportunities to reduce the environmental impacts of brewery waste in Albania. The students are Sarah Bormeister, Meister, Marissa Gonzalez, Katie Jessup, and Griffin Ong. Their advisors were professors Bob Hirsch and Bob Kennedy. Did that pop up okay? Yes. Okay, excellent. Okay. Hello, my name is Griffin St. Ange. I'm Katie Jessup. I'm Marisa Gonzalez. Okay. Missing Sarah, so just give us a second. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hello, my name is Griffin St. Ange. I'm Marisa Gonzalez. And I'm Katie Jessup. And first off, we would like to say thank you to the judges and everyone watching for giving us the opportunity to present to you today. We are really excited to talk to you about our project on assessing opportunities to reduce the environmental impact of brewery waste in Albania, which we completed in B term of 2019 at the Tirana IQP site. So for the duration of our project, we worked with Shukalb, which is an organization of wastewater professionals that advocates for improvements and investments in Albanian wastewater infrastructure. Shukalb was founded in the year 2000 by an Albanian American named Philip Giantris, who actually graduated from WPI in 1965. Over the years, Shukalb has developed several initiatives to educate the public and assess current wastewater practices and our project on investigating brewery waste management was a part of these initiatives. So the purpose of our project was twofold. First, Albania, which is shown at the bottom of the map, has been trying to enter into the European Union since 2009. Um, one of the requirements for membership is the effective regulation of wastewater and the environment. Understanding how industries, and in our case breweries, are dealing with their wastewater and how this will impact the development of infrastructure will ultimately be necessary for Albania to join the EU. Scientists predict that climate change will make water resources more scarce in Albania within the coming years. Identifying sources of water pollution and ways to reduce water usage in industry is one way to safeguard water resources and help reduce the effects of climate change. Okay, so Albania's wastewater treatment sector is very underdeveloped due to historical events that happened during the country's development. So from 1941 to 1990, Albania was under communist rule, and during this time, rapid industrialization took place, but there was little environmental oversight during, this, during the same time. Um, after the fall of communism in 1990, much of the population that used to live in rural areas flocked to city centers, but there was little um, infrastructure built for wastewater. The blue on this map indicates areas where the population decreased during this time, and the orange shows where it increased between the years 2001 and 2011. Many of the highly populated areas, including Tirana, which is the orange region in the middle of the map, um, are very populated but have no wastewater treatment. In fact, for a population of 2.9 million people, Albania only has 10 wastewater treatment facilities, and three of these are not in operation. So combined, they only have the capacity to treat 25% of the country's municipal and industrial wastewater. In the past 10 years, the EU has given Albania 110 million euros to help develop their water supply and wastewater sector. Um, and while funding is important for development, you have to understand where to spend it. So this means understanding current wastewater disposal practices and how they could be improved. 
breweries in Albania present a specific occurrence of pollution that has not been thoroughly studied yet, but has um, a large impact on the environment. Sarah, you're muted. You might want to check your mic settings on the bottom left corner. Don't worry, we can all be patient. It's fine, <laughs> this Zoom thing, we know it's a challenge. Yeah, there should be a little up arrow and you should be able to select your microphone. And if that doesn't work, then I'm sorry. <laughs> How about now? Yes. Sounds great. Awesome. Okay. It, it said I wasn't muted, so I couldn't tell it was wrong. <laughs> um, but I'm going to give you an introduction to the brewing process. Um, so the main ingredients for beer include water, malt, hops, and yeast. Um, the first three ingredients combine to form what's called wort, or the liquid base of beer. Um, the yeast ferments this liquid to create alcohol and in turn the beer that we all know. Um, and now all of these ingredients leave the brewing process just in different forms. Um, the first is wastewater, which is a large volume that contains things such as cleaning chemicals and organic material. The next is malt, which leaves a spent grain. This is followed by hops, which leaves a spent hops and trub, which is the proteins that are formed throughout the process. And lastly, the yeast leaves the process as dead yeast cells. The spent grain is usually strained out of the process and is a dry waste, and everything else is usually mixed in with wastewater. All right, so the brewing process produces large quantities of each of these waste products, and depending on how they're dealt with, they can have detrimental impacts on the environment. So most breweries use between three and 10 liters of water for every liter of beer they produce. So they consume and discharge large volumes of wastewater. Brewery wastewater also has a high organic content because it contains a mixture of the leftover beer, yeast, and trub. And the pH and chemical content of the wastewater is also impacted by the cleaning chemicals used in the process. When brewery wastewater is discharged directly into the environment without treatment, it natively impacts aquatic ecosystems and can even impact human health in the surrounding areas. And lastly, solid waste, including the spent grain, yeast, and hops are all organic materials that eventually decompose. If these byproducts enter waterways, they can also have a huge impact, possibly leading to things like fish kills and algae blooms. We work to identify ways Albanian brewers could reduce their environmental impact either by reusing, reducing, or treating their waste. And we also wanted to help them improve their current practices by suggesting newer methods that are both incentivized and reduce their, or induce their overall environmental impact. So to achieve these goals for our project, we developed four objectives. Our first objective was to see what US breweries do to reduce their environmental impact. Um, to do this, we toured local breweries in Massachusetts and interviewed them on their sustainability initiatives and how these initiatives impacted their business and operation costs. Um, once we were in country, our second objective was to assess the wastewater systems in Albania. Um, while interviewing the U.S. breweries, we found that they are typically connected to wastewater treatment systems in the local area, and we wanted to know if Albanian breweries were similarly connected to wastewater treatment infrastructure. We also wanted to know if these wastewater treatment plants had the capacity to treat brewery waste. Our third objective was to evaluate how Albanian breweries manage their solid waste and wastewater and identify improvements through touring and interviewing them like we did in the U.S. Um, our fourth and final objective was to figure out what factors influence Albanians to buy a certain brand of beer. So in the U.S., breweries are frequently um, able to advertise their sustainability initiatives and consumers pay more for a more sustainably brewed beer. So we wanted to know if Albanians were simil similarly influenced. So to achieve these objectives, we broke them down into three areas of data collection. 
interviews, tours, and surveys. We interviewed a variety of organizations, including 11 breweries, two wastewater treatment plants, four wastewater professionals, and three bars for a total of 20 interviews. For tours, we visited three breweries in America, six breweries in Albania, and two wastewater treatment plants in Albania for a total of 11 tours. For surveys, the customers of four bars in Toronto were distributed and the same survey was distributed online to Chacal's general mailing list. And in total, we collected 132 surveys. To help achieve our first objective, we interviewed and toured four breweries in America. These four breweries included Wormtown Brewery, Rapscallion Brewery, Redemption Rock Brewing Company, and Greater Good Imperials. The information we gained from these breweries provided us with a baseline, which we used to compare Albanian breweries to in our findings. This information also gave us examples of or possible like brewery waste management methods and taught us that we should focus on for our tours and interviews um, with Albanian breweries. To obtain, to obtain our data, our interviews and tours were spaced across Albania and shown here on the map will be an overview of those locations. The wastewater treatment plants we visited were in Vlora and Korcha. And the breweries include Bira Puka in Puka, Bira Korcha in Korcha. And then in Tirana, we have a concentration of breweries, which includes Bira Stella, Brauhaus, Jushi Beer, Bira Cowan, and Bira Tirana. We were also able to visit four bars in Tirana to distribute our paper surveys too. These four bars included Duff Sports Bar, where we got 19 paper surveys. Um, next was Cheers, where we received another 16. Illyrian Saloon was next, where we received 28 surveys. And then finally, Radio Bar, where we got another 10 for a total of 59 paper surveys. Of these four bars, we were able to interview the owner of three of them to see what makes them sell one type of beer over another and what determines their selection process for the beers that they sell. We also wanted to gauge whether or not they would be willing to sell a more sustainably brewed beer and how they believed their customers would react to it. Our interviews with water sector organizations and professionals helped the team better understand how wastewater disposal, how, how wastewater disposal methods are regulated. We found the environmental permit to be the most significant component to our project. This permit requires information on the brewery's projected capacity the source of its raw materials, and how the brewery plans to treat, reuse, or dispose of its waste. Under this permit, the National, the National Environmental Agency expects breweries to self-monitor and report their status every six months. They're required to contract a government-certified lab to test the water, air, and solid emissions from their process, but little is done beyond reporting these values. These permits frequently list no further treatment as an acceptable method for wastewater discharge, meaning that they're allowed to dispose of their wastewater directly into the environment. So without regulations to require treatment of waste before disposal, we found that breweries are only likely to change their practices if it can reduce their operating costs and increase profits. So we toured and interviewed two wastewater treatment plants in Albania. Um, the first plant was in Vlora. This is Albania's newest treatment plant and it is still under development right now. Um, as it only pre-treats urban wastewater from the city of Laura. Based on our interview with the plant employees and how the effluent stream that was discharged looked and smelled, um, we determined that the processes in place at this plant would not be sufficient to treat brewery wastewater. Our second plant that we toured was in Korcha. This plant is currently meeting Albanian discharge regulations, but only treats urban wastewater with one exception. So the local brewery, which is Vera Korcha, sends its wastewater to this treatment plant. Um, the most important thing that we learned was that five of the seven breweries that we toured were located in Tirana, where there is no wastewater treatment plants available. We concluded that the wastewater treatment infrastructure in Albania does not currently have the capacity or the technology to treat brewery wastewater. And right now the government is focusing on developing urban systems, but they're also neglecting the fact that industrial um, wastewater is a huge contributor to pollution. Because breweries do not have access to municipal systems, um, they have a greater responsibility to develop their own alternatives in order to protect the natural resources around them. So moving on to our third objective, our research and interviews um, found that the cleaning process produces the largest amount of wastewater. This is because breweries need to clean their tanks before and after each batch, 
creating a large volume of wastewater and spent cleaning chemicals. Now breweries don't like this large amount of water either, as we found it's their greatest operating cost. They need to pay to both use and dispose of water and Beer Corcha even noted that it's 65% of their production costs. Additionally, we saw that no brewery fully treated their wastewater before it was discharged. Now, given the high cost and volume of water, it's not surprising that we saw many breweries already had water reduction and reuse practices in place. This chart here shows that the majority of breweries use at least one water mitigation strategy, including clean in place systems, which reduce water consumption and efficient spray nozzles. Only three of the breweries neutralized the pH of their wastewater before they disposed it. For our solid waste findings, um, we found that five of the seven breweries we interviewed reused their yeast for multiple generations or brews. Juicy Beer did not, mainly because they are a craft brewery and craft breweries often change flavors between batches. And then since yeast absorbs the flavors during the brewing process, it cannot be reused if the next batch is a different flavor. Um, we also found that six of the seven breweries also recycle their spent grains to be used as animal feed for farmers. Larger breweries such as Beer Stella, Beer Corcha, Beer Toronto, Beer Count profit from these partnerships with farmers. Jushi Beer is the only one not to do this because they are currently looking for a new facility to brew in. But from our interview, um, they do plan on implementing this later on in the future. A newer method we were surprised to find because we did not see with our tours in America was a CO2 reuse system. Beer Corcha and Beer Toronto reuse the CO2 that's emitted during their fermentation process and reuse it later on in the packaging stage. This limits the overall CO2 emissions from the breweries and lessens their carbon footprint. This system is more common in larger breweries in America. Finally, every brewery that we interviewed did have some type of practice in place where they were able to reuse the bottles and kegs that they sold. Here we have an example of the paper survey that we distributed. Um, we employed what's called a Likert scale to ask consumers how much they agreed or disagreed with certain factors of purchasing beer. We found that the largest factor was that people tend to drink what their family and friends drink as it was significantly higher than the rest. This can be extracted to say that sample foods when it comes to purchasing beer. For whether consumers consider the environmental impact of a beer they purchase, this ranks second to last out of the factors. Um, breaking down responses to this, 20% of respondents agreed that this was important, but of the rest of the respondents, 49% strongly disagreed. This indicates that from our sample, while a percentage do consider the environmental impact of the beer, the vast majority do not prioritize this. From the bar owner interviews, we learned that the beer culture in Albania is relatively new and that consumers are looking for the next new and exciting beers. All the bars we interviewed sell few to no Albanian beers. The bar owners we interviewed indicated that this is because of the impression many consumers had that imported beer typically has better quality and taste. This correlates with our findings of Albanian beer consumption declining, turning more towards imported beer. At the end of our project, we were able to sum up all of our findings into a set of recommendations for both Shukalb and the breweries we met with. As mentioned from our survey data, we found that the majority of Albanian beer consumers did not consider the environmental impact of the beer they drink. We believe that a public education campaign should be developed to get consumers to focus on the impacts of brewing beer. We also believe this could alert beer consumers and possibly persuade their purchasing preferences to more environmentally friendly companies. To, insist, to assist with this, um, the team created a pamphlet with our research for Shukal to distribute to their various networks via email. We also recommend that a team should work to assist breweries in implement, implementing their own wastewater treatment systems. Building a wastewater treatment system would have the biggest impact on the brewery's overall environmental impact. Multiple breweries we met with expressed genuine interest in building their own treatment system. However, the biggest obstacles for most breweries are funding and available space. If a future team were able to assist them in designing their own wastewater treatment system, breweries may be more willing to do so in the future. So our first recommendation to breweries was to integrate environmentally friendly practices in their renovation and expansion plans. Uh, many of the breweries that we talked to, including Beer Jushi, Beer Korcha, and Beer Tirana, all said they were planning on updating or expanding parts of their processes in the near future. 
we suggested that when they do this, they should introduce as many water reduction and reuse procedures as possible. And doing this may be expensive at first, but ultimately it could save the brewery money in the long run. Um, the second recommendation was to reuse their spent yeast, hops, and trubs. Um, currently, the breweries are washing all of these byproducts down the drain, which causes their wastewater to have a high organic content. All of these waste products are suitable additives for either animal feed or soil fertilizer, so there are better disposal options available that could both limit their environmental impact and possibly produce another revenue stream. Our third recommendation was that breweries install their own wastewater treatment systems because they cannot rely on municipal systems. Um, doing this is costly, so we also suggested that the breweries collaborate with other neighboring industries to develop collective treatment systems. This would reduce the environmental impacts of multiple industries all at once. And lastly, we suggested that breweries begin advertising their sustainability initiatives. Um, although the consumer surveys showed that majority of customers don't prioritize their envir the environment in their purchases, 20% of respondents did consider it an important factor. And with a growing beer market, this may be an easy way for Albanian breweries to both engage their customers and gain a competitive advantage over foreign brands. In conclusion, the team found that Albanian brewery practices are comparable to companies around the world. The main disparity between the two groups was the availability of wastewater treatment. For example, in the US, breweries send their wastewater to municipal facilities where it's fully treated both physically and chemically. Breweries in Albania, except for Bira Korcha, cannot connect to wastewater treatment plants. This leaves Albanian breweries with a higher environmental impact by default because their wastewater enters the environment without treatment. We determined that currently the responsibility of waste treatment is on the breweries themselves, where investment and return value is the driving factor for them to both innovate and change. Re reflecting back on our time in Albania, there are three main impacts we think our project had. In recent years, there's been an emergence of craft breweries and agro-tourism in Albania. A project done by WPI IQP team this past year focused on bringing tourism out of the hotspots of Albania and to the farms and other small business owners in rural Albania. We think that in the future, as the restaurants and tourism industry continues to grow, so will the brewery industry. With growth in the tourism industry, we also think that Albania will rapidly improve their wastewater infrastructure to control pollution and make it a desirable destination to travel to. Within the past year, Albania has also been considered to be added to the EU, another important step towards getting additional funding for wastewater treatment plants. And finally, through this project, we were able to inform Shakal about current industry practices for dealing with wastewater and highlight where improvements can be made and support can be given. Every brewery visited understood that they could cut down on the environmental impacts of brewing beer, but did not have the resources or money to do so. With our recommendations, we hope we were able to highlight some areas Albanian breweries can both improve their businesses and reduce their environmental impact until wastewater infrastructure is improved. And these are our photo references. And thank you again to everyone for listening. And now we would be happy to take your questions and reflect on our experiences. Thank you all. Uh, Fantastic. Time for the judges. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, so um, this was great. Well done on the presentation and being the first out of the gate there is not easy. Um, maybe I'll get us started, but other judges should be thinking about it. I don't know if we can stop the slide share maybe so we can see each other. Yeah. But I don't know who's doing that. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. Um, well done. So my question is, um, what, what's the drinking age in Albania? Um, I think it was 18, but it wasn't very strictly enforced. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, that's, I was being funny. Like how, how psyched were you when you found out your yeah. Uh, your project was about beer. <laughs> it's just, I think it's amazing. And yeah, you took it and really turned it into something. Have you um, been able to follow up with your sponsor at all? It's been over a year since you were there, right? To find out kind of how, how things are going and whether they're carrying forward with some of your recommendations. Yeah, um, I can answer that question. So we reached out to our sponsor and she said that while a lot of the progress and things they're focus has shifted a lot towards just municipal wastewater treatment recently, um, given the fact that Tirana is their largest city that still doesn't have it. Um, in terms of beer in Albania and the growth of that, 
in the past year, she said that not many people have been able to go to restaurants with restrictions. Um, so a lot of that might have impacted, you know, how much these brands can grow or what they can do to get more initiatives. Um, but she said, hopefully in the coming year, when things start to open up back again, and with their work with um, agritourism, with another IQP group, they want to try to focus their efforts on shifting to smaller and more niche um, food destinations and maybe um, beer brewing as well. Exciting. Do you have a sense of whether any of the, the recommendations are really being picked up or, or planned to be picked up? Yeah, um, I can talk about that. I think that we sent, we were able to send all of these recommendations and whenever we toured and interviewed like the brewers and the wastewater professionals, they were all very like accepting and willing to learn about um, what we were talking about. So I think that they really did take it to heart given the fact of that the pandemic happened right after we left the country. I'm not sure how much they've been able to actually implement them, but I hope that in the future, you know, they'll really take them seriously. A lot of them realize that this could help their businesses lower their operating costs and, and increase their profits. So I think that it'll be a really good initiative in the future. To add on to that, um, something we found is the small craft breweries were really more receptive. We had a conversation with the owner of Jushi Beer, which is a small microbrewery. Um, and just talking to him, he didn't even know that you could give your spent grain to animals. And he was like, I would love to do that partnership things like that. And through our environmental permits, we saw that there was maybe one or two craft breweries emerging in Albania as well. So I think starting small is definitely the place where we could get more of an impact um, since a lot of the larger breweries definitely had their own processes in place and large scale operations. So just from our findings, the small ones were definitely really receptive. Yeah, and I was gonna ask, so in your opinion, now, how, how motivated uh, do you feel the large breweries were um, to change the current situation or to address the current situation, especially given the cost of implementing the system and then the um, competition from uh, foreign bears as well, too? Yeah, um, I can speak on that one a little bit if someone wants to add in something as well. But um, a lot of the breweries, a lot of people are um, and in order to compete with a lot of these foreign brands, they were trying to reduce that. And something we saw is um, when we met with a professor from the Polytechnic University of Tirana, she mentioned how the Coca-Cola company in Albania had their own wastewater treatment plant and mm -hmm. that she's talked to them before about working with different industries to kind of connect to those. And when you have your own treatment options, it reduces your cost of water because you don't have to send it from different places. Um, tap water is not something that you can drink in Albania, so they have to pay to bring all of this water in either from um, tapped resources or just buying it in bulk. Um, so paying to um, have that water leave the process as well, where they could just treat it in site is definitely, I think, a driving factor for that. Um, but it depends on the collaboration and what they can afford at the time. Oh, interesting. Con congratulations to all of you. Um, I have a question on how the wastewater treatment plants uh, took the recommendations. I, I, I don't know if they looked at the, the byproduct of the breweries in a, in a negative fashion, you know, treating uh, human, human uh, uh, waste compared to brewery waste was, is it seen as a, a more difficult uh, byproduct to treat? And so were they anti-brewery or, or were they, they interested in, in uh, working more with uh, you know, being able to take on more uh, more wastewater product. Yeah, I can speak on that. Um, so as, as far as treating brewery wastewater, it's not really much different than treating regular um, sewer wastewater. It's pretty much the same process. You just mix it all together. So I think that they were definitely very receptive on being able to do that. But right now they're focused more on just being able to expand their treatment facilities. Like right now, they have trouble um, even just treating wastewater in the city itself, let alone the industries. So I think that as far as working with our sponsor and working with the wastewater treatment plants, I think that as the wastewater treatment sector in Albania continues to grow, they're definitely going to be able to integrate some of those industries, but it's just a matter of funding right now. Hmm. And I guess as a follow-up, was there, was there any interest in, in terms of the solution set of recommendations that uh, Coca-Cola, for example, having to, uh, I guess they did that by choice. They opted to 
have their own wastewater treatment. They, they're, they're not, that's not something that uh, from, from a regulatory option that the governments were thinking of that for the breweries, or I guess what, what inspired Coca-Cola to, to, to do that in, in your mind? And is that a, applicable to the breweries? Um, when I, we had talked with the professor, she had just mentioned kind of in passing that Coca-Cola had put that together. Um, but based on operation costs, I think that's probably what they would look to do, um, especially if they have trouble in finding places to actually dispose of it because the Coca-Cola plant was located just outside of Tirana, um, whereas some of these breweries had um, rivers or more land to dispose of things. Um, so I don't know if it was a mix of kind of the space they were situated in and then operation costs. Great, thanks. Yeah, wonderful work. Really exciting. Albania just seems like such a fascinating country and congratulations. Um, uh, we probably have to move on. Is that right, Kent? That's right. Thank okay. you very much. It's That's already fun. Well done. Everybody give big claps to the team. Big claps. <laughs> uh, so it's time for our second presentation. Um, went very quickly. This one is improving emergency preparedness in Monteverde, Costa Rica. The students are Alejandra Garza, Dante Knight, Nancy Nguyen, and James Witt. Their advisors were Professors Creighton Peep and William San Martin. Can you see my screen? Yep. Right, perfect. Somebody. Oh, um, I, my, I can't share my video because I think Ruth um, disabled it. I'm sorry, who just spoke to me? Because I can only find um, two people. To oh, um, Nancy. Okay. Yeah, also, could you uh, pin me, please? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, sorry, bear with me. Take your time, folks. I'll get it. I think you're all set now. Cool. Thank you. Just get started then. All right, awesome. Uh, hey, uh, we're the Monteverde Costa Rica IQP team and our sponsor was the National Emergency Commission or the CNE. And we worked on developing an emergency preparedness plan for Monteverde. I'm Alejandra. I'm Dante. I'm Nancy. And I'm James. So before we begin, we'd just like to apologize for any time lags in the presentation, technology is rough, you know, <laughs> such as life. So, uh, so Monteverde is a beautiful settlement with a residential population of a few hundred people. And during our off hours, we hiked, did many fun activities and took pictures that captured the natural beauty of the area, like glow in the dark scorpions and hollow climbable trees. So when we say Monteverde, we mean the settlement Monteverde and not the district. And I know this sounds confusing, so we'll break it down for you guys a bit. In Costa Rica, there are seven provinces, which is shown by the different colors on the map. Uh, these provinces are further split into cantons, which are denoted by the different shades of colors. And these cantons are further split up into districts, which are shown by all the different little uh, lines and etched out segments. So we were in the Monteverde district. Now, Costa Rica is located between a bunch of tectonic plates which leads to many different devastating natural disasters, such as earthquakes, volcanic activity, and tsunamis. And as you can see here, there's only one major road in, uh, in Monteverde. So any natural disaster that occurs in Monteverde runs the risk of wiping out the road, further isolating Monteverde and wreaking havoc on the local infrastructure. 
In October 2017, tropical storm, storm Nate took an unexpected turn last minute and hit Monteverde, causing landslides and flash fl floods, which led to no internet or cellular communication for several days, the loss of homes and property, and it had a negative economic impact due to the loss of tourism and cost of repairs. Furthermore, it caused the destruction of the main road James mentioned earlier, isolating Monteverde for four days, where they lacked access to food, clean water, and medication. As a response to Nate, the community established Monteverde's Emergency Subcommittee, which is an extension of the Comisión Nacional de Emergencias, or CNE, as James mentioned earlier. The issue with the CNE is that while they're very effective at reacting to emergencies, they're not very good with preparedness, which is why they were not able to provide much help when Monteverde was isolated. Through our research for this project, we learned that being prepared is extremely crucial if we want to reduce the impact of disasters. Therefore, the goal for project was to establish a foundation for an emergency preparedness plan and identify the areas that needed improvement in the subcommittee. Our project was divided into three sections, a map of important locations in Monteverde during emergencies, detailed warehouse plans, and an emergency protocol for educating residents about natural disasters. And now we will go over our first deliverable, the map. So our first observation that we made working on the map was that many houses in Monteverde are hidden. Some of these houses cannot be seen from satellite images and we had to rely on the clinic's map and knowledge from Hainer Alvarado Huertas, the person who made the base of our map, Jorge Torres, a member of the emergency subcommittee and Alexander Badia, a field doctor for the Clinic of Health. Next, we found that each department in the Emergency Commission uses a different map with different threats and things marked on them. We believe that it would be better instead to make a unified map so that all the departments could have access to the same information. Our last observation was that these departments rely greatly on their knowledge of the area. This means that outside organizations that come to Monteverde have to rely on the locals' familiarity with the area in order to conduct relief efforts. The program that we used to accomplish our goal of making a unified map was ArcGIS. This program allowed us to add multiple layers to a base map that can be toggled on and off to tailor to the specific needs of each department while still having the ability to see what other departments normally see if need be. Uh, so, we got a head start on the map uh, using one that has ar had, it, had already been compiled by Hainer. This map included public roads, buildings, rivers, and landslide sites from before. Uh, this map helped us because it meant we had a very strong starting point instead of just starting from scratch. So now I'm going to talk about what we added to the map. Our first addition was adding all the houses that appear in the health clinics map. At first, we were doing this by looking at the maps you see on screen, but we later met with Alex from the health clinic to verify the accuracy, and he helped with adding new houses that were not on the hand-marked maps. We also added helicopter landing sites to the map. I won't go into too much detail about these sites in the interest of time, but they were located at the old bullfighting arena, the field behind the Monteverde Friends School, an important bilingual Quaker school, and the soccer field in Santa Elena. We decided on these areas after consulting one of the local experts. Our next addition was emergency meeting points so that people know where to go during and after emergencies. These locations include CASEM, a previously used emergency meeting point, the Monteverde Institute, a school well-established in the community, and the Friends School that I mentioned before. We decided on these locations because of their historical importance during Tropical Storm Nate as meeting points. We also added the sites where the warehouses that we proposed will be built. Later, Nancy will talk about how these sites were chosen and where they're located. Lastly, we added some private roads to the map because these roads do not appear on Google Maps or in Hainer's original map. We added these with the help of Hainer, Jorge, and Alex. So here you can see an example of how the final map looked. Uh, so the, the greenish blue areas are landslide sites from the past. The blue lines are rivers. The green lines are public roads. The red lines are private roads. And the small dots are houses or other buildings. And uh, so now I'll talk about our recommendations that we made to the CNE. Uh, so we, we recommended that the CNE use the map to educate the public on the risks that are in the area and what they can do during and after emergencies to lessen the impact. 
We also made recommendations that the areas of risk be developed to include more than just landslides. We couldn't include more than this because we didn't have the time during our project, but we think that it would be very useful and would also complement our app. Lastly, we made recommendations that this map be distribu distributed to outside organizations either before or after they come for disaster relief so, they, so that they can know where to go without needing to have a local in each team. And now I'll hand it off to Nancy. Thank you, Dante. So next we will talk about our second deliverable, the warehouse. In our discussions with our sponsor, Maricela, and in our interview with a retired engineer from the municipality, they noted that this bridge, Puente Alborio, is not as structurally sound as it should be. And they said that in the next major disaster, it's likely going to collapse, splitting Monteverde into two. So there is a need to prepare each area in case this happens. And Maricela suggested that a warehouse in each section would be very helpful. Puente Alborio is located here, circled in red near the cheese factory of Monteverde. As you can see, it is also between the Monteverde Institute and the French School, two major centers of communication in the community, which Maricela and many of the people we interviewed suggested are the most ideal locations for warehouses. We then interviewed the head of the Monteverde Institute and the head of the French School to hear their thoughts and opinions on the matter. And they were very supportive and willing to let us use their space for a warehouse to be built. Our proposal thus included designing a warehouse in each location with enough supplies to sustain that side of Monteverde for a week, as well as a spreadsheet per location with recommended supplies and calculations. First, we will go over the supply lists. As I've said before, we created one spreadsheet per warehouse and each spreadsheet contains a master tab and a summary tab. You can see the example of a summary tab here for Monteverde Institute. It contains the emergency supplies we recommend be stored in the warehouse, organized by type, as well as the warehouse necessities, such as shelves and backup generators. This list highlights the costs and quantities per supply. And this information is pulled from the more detailed master tab, which I will go into later in the next slide. But to summarize this slide, the types of supplies that are on the list includes things people are most likely going to need during emergencies, such as water filters, medical kits, and extra mattresses. We of course put this together with consultation of Maricela to ensure that we had considered everything and working together with her allowed us to see the importance of considering all possibilities we've never thought of before, such as having extra food for pets and strays. For our master tab, I will give a high level summary of what additional elements it includes and what it exactly does. So first to highlight what it includes, the master tab contains more specific information about the average cost per person, the average cost per family, as well as the volume each supply takes up. Secondly, it allows the user to specify the number of people they are considering and specify which supplies should be included or excluded. Then finally, it automatically calculates the total overall cost of the supplies and warehouse necessities, as well as the total overall volume which is what we used when we consider how big the warehouse should be. A good thing to note here is that even though we worked on the spreadsheets and tried to include what's necessary, they are not conclusive spreadsheets. They are something we help start, something that is accessible to be edited and improved upon in the future by others. The point of these spreadsheets is to encourage and lay the foundation for more advanced warehouse plants. With us giving our sponsor the platform to start off on, it would help give the push needed to get the plan rolling. With that, we will go into the actual warehouse designs. So on the Monteverde side of the bridge, the north side, the population is approximately 271. Using the supply list to calculate the volume and using SOLIDWORKS to model the layout, we found the size of the warehouse to be approximately six by five by three meters in a picture of our model can be seen on the right. Here is the layout of the warehouse with the recommended allocation of space for supplies and shelves. To highlight, the combustibles are recommended to be stored in a separate unit away from the other supplies to, to reduce fire hazards. And another thing to note is that the reason why the warehouse is so large is due to the mattress. So we did make recommendations to possibly store the warehouses elsewhere if they want to reduce the size of the warehouse. 
Then on the friend side school, the friend school side of the bridge or the southern side, the population is approximately 283. Using the same techniques as before, on the size of the warehouse to be about eight and a half by three by three by four by three meters. And on the right is a picture of our model. Here is the recommended layout of the warehouse with the combustibles again in its own housing. The issue with the mattresses taking up a lot of space is still there. So again, we made the same recommendations here to our sponsor to have another place to store them if possible. And like our supply list, we don't expect these warehouse models to be exactly used in the final uh, warehouse architecture way down the line. They certainly contain valuable information and recommendations. However, it's good to keep in mind that these preliminary, these are preliminary uh, warehouse designs with the purpose to demonstrate the feasibility of having warehouses. And with that, I will pass it off to James. So our third deliverable was our emergency protocol. Our goal for this deliverable was to distribute our emergency protocol to as many people as possible. And we accomplished this goal in two ways, a mobile app and infographics. So an issue that we found was that tourists speak many different languages, which makes it complicated to distribute information. So we decided to create a mobile application to overcome the language barrier. We conducted surveys while in the area and they showed that 70% of tourists and majority of locals are comfortable enough using their phone that they can download apps. And additionally, we found that English, Spanish, French, and German are the four most common languages among both residents and tourists. So the app can be used on all four of those languages and can be accessed by the majority of people in the area. The user can also choose what region they are currently living in so that they can receive the most accurate and relevant information possible because each region faces slightly different risks. A map of the region will also be displayed so that the user can know the layout of the area if they're not familiar with it. The user can then choose whether they'd like information uh, to get more information on a specific risk, such as a landslide, a flood, and fire. And they can also choose to get information on natural disasters, such as a tropical storm, an earthquake, and volcanic activity. The user can learn what the risk of it is, uh, what to do during it, and how to prepare for it. The information is different for residents and for tourists. Uh, for residents, we gave them more information on what types of items prioritized and save and where to go because they're more familiar with the local area. Whereas for tourists, we give them information on who to contact to receive better instructions because we figure that tourists uh, would be very relatively unfamiliar with the area and would probably have all their um, valuables in one area already ready to go. Uh, there's also a list of emergency contact info that users can access at any time to contact the proper services in times of danger. While the app is good at portraying information in many different demographics, there are people who are not comfortable enough with their phone to use an app or just don't have a phone at all. So we've decided to create infographics as well. And we've created infographics for a multitude of, uh, of things such as landslides, flash floods, earthquakes, fires, volcanic eruptions, and emergency kits. So all of our infographics are made in English and also in Spanish, the top two common languages. And all the infographics have emergency numbers at the bottom, which you can see here in this example. For this particular infographic, the purpose is to encourage residents to store some emergency supplies in their homes. The infographic splits up the supplies into four main categories, sustenance, such as food, water, medicines, energy sources and communication, such as batteries and flashlights, personal care items such as toiletries and metal kits, useful items and documents such as portable chargers and emergency contacts. Here's another infographic which focuses on preparing for landslides. As you can see on the top right, it has a map of Cerro Plano, which highlights the areas of risk so residents can see if they're close to one. We created different versions of this infographic with specific maps depending on the locations. It then indicates when to go where to go, when to evacuate, oops, sorry, when to evacuate and where to go depending on the situation. It also recommends to pay close attention to the news and to have your stuff ready to go in case you need to evacuate. Other than the supply infogra infographic, with Nancy, which Nancy just talked about, the infographics containing information about natural disasters all have four major sections re refer referencing what to do to prepare, 
what to do during the disaster, and what to do after the disaster, as well as highlighting common risks specific to the disaster. So the infographics, while good at spreading information to those who won't use the app, is also rather expensive to print and can be a large waste of paper, making it costly to distribute to every individual. Therefore, we made recommendations to the subcommittee to instead print a couple of these infographics and put them in public spaces, such as the Friends School and the Monteverde Institute, as well as distributed digitally through Facebook and WhatsApp groups. Another way to ensure that a large portion of the residents can access the information is to print them on annual calendars that the majority of residents have in their homes. This is one of the, our recommendations made to the CNE for future considerations. In summary, our project succeeded in laying the foundation for a preparedness plan that will continue to grow and develop over time, which will help mitigate the aftermath of disasters. Furthermore, through our research, we learned that climate change will lead to an increase, increased frequency and severity of disasters, as well as create new dangers in the area. So our project encouraged the thinking ahead towards unforeseen disasters that are not common in Monteverde, such as fires and volcanic activity, which will increase the relevancy of our project in the future. So what was the lasting impact of our project one year later? As we all know, COVID happened, which affected the amount of work the committee could put into our project. But we kept in touch with our sponsor and she updated us on, updated us on how different aspects of the project have been used. Unfortunately, they have not been able to use the app since the number of tourists has decreased drastically, but they have continued to work on it and plan to use it in the future once tourists begin coming back to Monteverde. Aside from that, the infographics have been a huge help and they have begun spreading them through social media and placing them in public spaces. They've mentioned that a couple of new people have joined, have been added to the community and our project has helped to explain the group's goals and to keep everyone on the same page. Finally, the project has served as an important foundation for spreading information and safety precautions throughout the community, which is especially important during times such as these. So working on this project helped us realize the impact being prepared can have on the community. This is especially relevant since the effects of climate change are expected to grow in the near future, exposing communities all around the world to more severe and unexpected disasters. We learned that it's important to not only figure out what information is necessary to mitigate damage, but also to figure out how to distribute that information to people. We also learned the importance of working directly with locals in the community to figure out how to tailor our plan to that specific community. We hope that future teams and even outside humanitarian interests doing research on emergency protocol and climate control would be able to find applications of our project in their work. And we hope that they would be able to build upon our project to create or improve emergency response plans for any scenario, in any region, for any disaster. So thank you all for listening to our presentation. We also would like to give special thanks to our IQP advisors, Professor Pete and Professor San Martin for the tremendous amount of support they gave us. Maristela Solis, our sponsor's main point of contact for her wholehearted efforts and involvement in the project, as well as all of the connections, resources, and support she gave us both inside and outside of project work. All of the local experts and members of the local uh, emergency subcommittee that we interviewed and connected with for their help and advice. WPI for establishing this project site location and sponsor connection, giving us the op unique opportunity to have our IQP there. And lastly, we would also like to give a little, uh, we would also like to give a shout out to all of our parents for their unwavering support throughout all of our experiences and also the other IQP teams in Monteverde for making the two month experience unforgettable. And that's all. So are there any questions? Thank you very much, judges. Okay, that was great. What an incredible place that looks like. I'm gonna open it up for my colleague judges to ask questions. I have one too, but I'm not gonna go first. Well, I'll dive in. Wondering, I was wondering about the, the costs. I mean, how sustainable would this be for such a small community? And, and did you factor in kind of the recurring costs of having to refresh supplies um, periodically? Good question. I, I can take this answer. So um, when we were putting together a supply list, we were putting... Um, we're listing out certain supplies that were most likely going to be needed. And we did consider that since it's a small community, um, the funding for um, 
the supplies and for the warehouse would be quite expensive. So um, the total cost was, uh, I don't have the exact number, but um, the total cost was a bit more expensive than what the government or what the uh, local community municipality could afford. So they were thinking about getting funding from um, like donations from the locals and from tourists and they're planning on um, having, I think, little um, donation boxes throughout the, uh, the little town and settlement. But with COVID happening, I don't think um, in the near future that is going to um, be implemented anytime soon. And uh, I'll, I'll also add that the, the spreadsheet with all the supplies uh, allows the the users to you know include or not include any of the things that we recommended they have so they can take out things or keep things as they need to uh, fit their budget thank you so much i was just curious mark go ahead <clears throat> i was curious is this kind of effort being undertaken across other parts of costa rica because obviously the weather impacts the entire country there so did the earthquakes and volcanoes. <laughs> so we focus mostly on Monteverde, but since the subcommittee is an extension of the CNE, and when we presented our, our project to them, there were also members from like the, the larger organization. So we do think that they um, can grab stuff from our project and apply it to all of Costa Rica. So does the CNE then provide funding to uh, undertake these projects? Um, so one of the main issues was that the CNE only provides aid once the disaster has occurred, which is was one of the issues we had. So that's why the subcommittee that focused on focused on preparedness was uh, created. So they won't be able to provide much funding for all these things. Are there other funds available from Costa Rica then to do that the pre planning as opposed to just the active? Sorry. Are there other funds available in Costa Rica to be able to do that pre-funding to get the supplies in place before the uh, hacks then occur? Um, we're not sure, but our sponsor, Maricel, the, the community was very close and they all, ex most of them experienced Nate and most, a lot of them were willing to donate and to participate in funding this project. And also they have usually they had thousands of tourists and tourists in the community so and they were all we think they would be able to donate as well Thank you. So just a quick question and, and wonderful job guys uh, so how, how did you plan on promoting the app to tourists essentially how would you make them aware that this resource is available take over uh so our sponsor thought that partnering with hotels and also a, a bunch of tourists to stay there uh used airbnb so we she thought of partnering with them and having hotels display like the qr code or like advertise the app would encourage tourists to to download it and also uh asking airbnb to have like a poster in the house or something that encourages the, the tourists to download it that was our our main strategy for letting them know of the app. Thank you. I was going to give you kudos for uh, having tectonic plates on your slide. So first of all, you get points for me for that. Well done. Uh, so I love that you all are working on emergency preparedness because I feel like that's like been breakfast, lunch, and dinner for me this last year at WPI because We've been in a crisis. We've been managing a crisis here with COVID, and I was just interested as you know. Now here, you have thought a lot about how to communicate with people during a crisis, how to be prepared. You know, what if any uh, lessons would you take from what you learned in Costa Rica to apply to how we're managing COVID at WPI? I know that's a little bit of a strange question, but I'm just you know, it's such an important toolkit to have. Um, what do you think are we doing and what might you do differently? Um, I can go first with this one. Um, so my first thought was that in our project and what we've done in Monteverde, we did a lot of communication 
And I think that communication is one of the important aspects of um, making a preparedness plan and also trying to get people to um, quarantine and spreading the information out and um, preparing for like specific issues like COVID. So I think communication there is, is up there. Um, I think another uh, thing that could be applied here is also just um, being close to everyone and communicating digitally. I think through Zoom, um, obviously that is um, a, way, a way to like connect with people because I think that in the pandemic, some people get pretty lonely, um, especially being far away from others. Mm -hmm. And um, that connection there is pretty important as well. Anybody else want to jump in on that? Um. I, I guess I'll, I'll speak a little bit. Yeah, I, I think like preparedness is like probably the biggest thing. I mean, it's it's kind of the biggest theme in our project, you know, uh, and it's like most of the recommendations we made. And it's a good reason because, you know, being prepared um, really saves you a lot of trouble in the in the future for when the problem comes. Uh, it's just it's just a matter of putting the work uh, before the problems. Um, I guess specifically in ways that maybe like, I, I don't know how we could have prepared for this. Uh, maybe having like, uh, I don't know, like backup online lesson plans like ready. I don't know that maybe, but you know, there's, there's always a trade off in, in how you prepare for things and, and what like you get out of the preparation and whether or not it's actually worth it. So. Yeah, one of the things we did do is a year before the pandemic started, we actually hired our first full-time director of emergency management at WPI. So it turned huh. out. Yeah, we we uh, interviewed him uh, for a project, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Colonel yeah. Mishita, he's the yeah. man. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's good. That's very good. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, you know, in hindsight, that was really smart, but we're just lucky that we, uh, we had done it. And so we were more prepared, I think, than a lot of places. Well, thank you all so much. Very uh, exciting. And my goodness, looks like you took advantage of everything that beautiful region had to offer. <laughs> I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Once in a lifetime opportunity, really. Definitely. Incredible. We were very grateful that we actually had this opportunity um, before, like right before the pandemic really um, got bad. So you were there C term last year, yeah. 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 We got our just as cases, we're coming right in. Oh my goodness. What? Stressful. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Yeah, thank you. Back to you. Thank you all. We've a minute behind here or two, but we'll go to our third presentation right away. It's the Jazz History Database Global Contributor Project, and the students involved are Mikel Maticoli and Lucas Varela. Oh, there we go. Hello. Um, I will, oh, looks like Lucas is already on video, so I'll start the screen share. All righty. Uh, can everybody see that okay? Awesome. Um, we'll get right into it then. One moment, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay, you're all set. Sorry about that. Ready? No worries. Um, so, hello. Uh, my name is Michael Matacoli. I'm a fourth year CS and interactive media and game dev major uh, here at WPI. Hi, my name is Lucas Varela. I'm a CS major uh, and I actually just graduated this last December. And we're super excited to be here today to share the story with you of the Jazz History Database Global Contributor Project. That's right. We would like to start off by showing you a quick introductory video to the Jazz History Database so that you can hear about it in the words of our founder, Professor Rich Falco. 
I was quite interested in uh, the earlier jazz artists here in the city. And part of it had to do with the fact that uh, they weren't getting any younger. Many of the uh, original mentors were long past and some recently passed. I thought it was important to document their stories. The Jazz History Database is an online service and it's free, open to the public. We tried to create a multifaceted profile of an individual by using multimedia. We go for primary source material, we preserve all of that, and then we present it online in a very user-friendly way and then archive the other for historical purposes. So the archival process involves attaining the material and students process by digitizing everything. And it can be television shows, it can be home videos even, recordings in many different formats. They're sometimes old reel-to-reel, -reel. sometimes uh, they're platters and discs, uh, old wax disc recordings or shellac discs, things of that nature. Old photographs, newspapers that are disintegrating. We're trying to preserve those kinds of things. We know a lot about Duke Ellington and Count Basie and Miles Davis, and of course, a lot of their materials have been preserved. But what about those individuals who remained in a geographic region? That's what we're really after, trying to capture that. Being in physical contact with the musicians and handling materials that were not in any way edited has really enriched my musicianship, I think, and my understanding of research in general. I was Alrighty. Yeah, so super cool organization. Uh, I first learned about the Jazz History Database in C term of 2019 uh, and the decades of work that have gone into preserving countless jazz artifacts that might have otherwise been lost. Uh, and it was really amazing to see how students as part of their coursework, uh, work study, or even as volunteers would digitize these artifacts and hand build the web pages to showcase them on jazzhistorydatabase.com. Um, getting to see the JHCB behind the scenes and the sheer volume of all sorts of artifacts, recordings, photographs, biographies, and more uh, was really mind boggling. Uh, in a term where travel was out of the question, we still really had the experience of being pulled into this rich jazz world. And it was truly just a thoroughly amazing experience all around. Um, while a lot of the materials early days of the JHCB featured artists in New England, there was a mounting international interest in the JHCB uh, right as we were getting uh, the project started. Yeah, as Michael mentioned, uh, around 2019, uh, so amazing outreach efforts by the JHDB team brought archivists, artists, uh, educators, scholars, and many other kinds of correspondents from several countries uh, suddenly into contact with the JHDB. Scholars from all over the world started seeking us out in little Worcester, Massachusetts to preserve their own region's history by contributing to our website. You know, it was incredible. The Jazz History Database was about to go international. It was the dawn of a new age, the JHDB. We needed a way to empower our international correspondents who have access to the necessary technologies to contribute to the archive quickly and remotely. So to reach our international correspondents, we created the Jazz History Database Global Contributor Portal. It's a simple web form, really accessible from virtually any internet-capable uh, internet device, that outputs web pages from hand built web page templates. This portal is accessible by invitation only to our accredited contributors, and it empowers them to build their own web pages for the online museum without, really, without really needing to write any website code. Once they're done building a web page, the portal starts an approval process with the JHDB team to then automatically publish their page directly to the JHDB website. We've created a unique system that enables collaborative contribution to our online museum fully remotely. Our solution bridges together multiple disciplines to reach scholars around the globe and to push the Jazz History Database and its mission into the future. So the screenshot that you're seeing here to the right is a very early prototype of the contributor portal. Uh, it looks very different from that now. Um, we were very aware from the start of the project that we were designing for a non-technical audience. Uh, and as such, we put a lot of thought into every little detail from the color scheme, the placement of each individual button, um, the overall flow of the process. We did a lot of research to figure out how to balance these design objectives as well with financial constraints. Um, so we had to make this tool functional and usable in a pretty tight time frame, but we were also limited to technologies that would not incur any additional infrastructure costs. Um, so we'd like to actually show you a short video of this process from a contributor's perspective. Um, this demo is much faster paced, of course, than our how-to guide for contributors, 
but we want to give you a feel for how quick and easy it is to build a published web page using this tool. Um, so right here uh, is an example of what one of these pages might look like. Um, so you've got a bio photo, um, some biography text, uh, and then collection of media, images, audio, uh, videos, just images and audio for this particular uh, one. So in the contributor portal, um, I can log in uh, and contributors receive their login credentials via email when they're invited. And right away, they're dropped into this info page that has a step-by-step -step walkthrough of uh, everything they can do in the contributor portal. So first thing I'm gonna do is in the second tab uh, where I can upload files. So with a click of a button, I'm brought to this page uh, where I can select files from my computer. Uh, so I have a folder on my desktop that has all the materials for the Bill Warfield collection. Uh, so some images uh, and an audio interview. This is of course a smaller uh, version just for the purposes of the demo, but in just a few seconds, all that content's uploaded to the secure JHDB archive. And then um, back in the contributor portal, I can go to the My Pages view and create a page for Bill Warfield. So I do that. Uh, and right away, I'm dropped into uh, this web form that we showed you the early prototype of earlier. So um, this has all sorts of fields starting with uh, attribution. Uh, if someone submitted the materials, I can, with the click of a button, pick the bio photo that I just uploaded. So um, I'll do that. And then off screen in a Microsoft Word document, I also have a pre-written biography for Bill Warfield. So I can copy paste that in. Um, this is just a simple piece of text for demo purposes, but it'll actually keep any formatting and allow me to edit the formatting in line. Uh, and now on to images. Um, so with a single click, I can also link all of these images that I just uploaded, uh, except for the bio photo, of course, which we've already selected. And uh, the next part of this process is pretty cool. Uh, so uh, previously students would have to resize these images individually in Photoshop to get them ready uh, for web, but uh, we've actually fully automated that process. So once I've added in the captions, I can click generate optimized images. And as that's running in the background, uh, I can actually finish building my page and link up the audio interview. Click, I'm going to add in my audio clip and select the interview that I just uploaded. And I can put a caption on this one as well. My images have finished optimizing. So I'll add in my caption uh, and in a few moments, those changes will be saved. And just like that, uh, I can click the preview button and actually see what my page is going to look like when it's published just about instantaneously. So here it is uh, with the bio photo, all of the text that we just put in and uh, all of the images and the interview content. So in just a little over four minutes, um, we've built this page pretty much from scratch. Uh, so as a contributor, I can mark this page as ready for review and an email will get sent to the JHDB review team. So on their end, uh, they can see that there's a page awaiting review uh, and click right into that and see all of the content that's linked on the page, uh, as well as preview it before publishing, just to make sure everything looks okay formatting wise and in terms of content. So um, again, same as the preview you just saw. And once it's ready to go uh, with just a single click that can be published straight to the Jazz History Database website. Uh, and the process is super quick uh, in less than a second. Uh, I can now click on the view published button and jump straight to the website where you can see that this is now hosted on global.jazzhistorydatabase.com. And uh, there's the page looking just like it did in the preview. And uh, this is public and it's ready to be linked on uh, the front page of the website, along with all of the other content that we have uh, from a ton of contributors in a ton of countries. Uh, yep. Yeah. So we had the pleasure of working uh, very closely with super enthusiastic JHDB staff and correspondents to build out the contributor portal based on real user feedback. Uh, and over the course of the IQP, we probably put out over 30 iterations of the contributor portal uh, and put it in front of users to test for themselves and give feedback on. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, let me tell you, uh, once we published this tool, uh, it was able to accomplish so much more than we had originally intended. Uh, well, I got I first got involved with the Jazz History Database as a student, student worker all the way back in 2018. And um, after working on the online museum for almost a year myself, I was surprised by the amount of man hours that really needed to, to be put into getting all this content, um, you know, this really unique content out to the public. And I find I found myself thinking quite often, you know, there's got to be a better way. And uh, what, we didn't, we, what we ended up doing with our project is we came up with a better way. Uh, we realized that our student workers could use the portal just as well as our correspondents. Uh, when we published our portal, the JHDB team began to absolutely crush their work and quickly overcome huge backlogs that previously had. Uh, and since our portal made it so easy to publish content that fit neatly into a template, the team got to focus more on complex content and complex design task, tasks for the website um, opening more doors to some you know, innovative collections and more intricate, uh, you know, intricate stuff for the online museum. Additionally, you know, through the use of our pre-built templates, our portal encourages consistent aesthetic and thematic choices throughout the online museum, from our international correspondents to the student workers on the GHDB team. And since typical content can really be published by anyone, the JHDB team now also has ample time to focus on producing more of these hand-built, high-quality templates that are used in the portal, so that this cycle of increasing returns can continue. So we knew going in that this was going to be a pretty high-stakes project. Um, of course, we had Professor Falco and the Jazz History Database team that were really eager to expand their outreach efforts and onboard new correspondents and contributors. Um, the student workers at the JHDB, as Lucas just mentioned, drew a lot of benefit from the tool as well. Um, automating away a lot of the, the manual repetitive aspects of their work uh, and giving them the chance to focus on, on more design centric tasks. And uh, most importantly, the international correspondence uh, and the global jazz community as a whole really, by the time we were wrapping up the project, there were correspondents lined up in over 20 countries, uh, the Netherlands, Austria, Berlin, Czech Republic, just to name a few. Um, so many scholars were immediately interested in contributing to the website and preserving their region's history, and now they have the power to do so themselves. So once that content is online, jazz archivists, educators, and enthusiasts all around the world can visit the museum and take advantage of this content. So obviously the development of our portal couldn't come without any challenges. Uh, so originally we planned to release our tool globally on April 30th last year, uh, which happens to be International Jazz Day. Uh, as with other projects, our efforts were, sh were surely impacted by the impromptu remote working situation. Uh, however, we decided we were gonna double our efforts and quickly adapt in order to bring this tool to a future complete state by the end of April. And we actually publicly released this version uh, its first version shortly thereafter. So uh, the starting point for this project was actually all the way back in D-term of 2019, when we successfully conducted a proof of concept project as an independent study. Uh, from a technical perspective, we wanted to ensure that ideas and technologies would all work together uh, in the way we wanted them to. So fast forward to 2020, and we scoped our D-term on-campus IQP for the development, user training, and public release of our global contributor portal. And by the conclusion of our project, we finished the core functionality of the portal, conducted user testing, and trained several of the GHDB staff to use the tool. Last June, we officially released the first version of the portal to our student workers and correspondents. And let me tell you, from what they told us, it has done wonders. So we've talked a little bit about the context behind the project and what we accomplished as part of the IQP. Um, but as you might imagine, our story really doesn't end with the IQP. Um, so in June of 2020, just as we were wrapping up the uh, first iteration of the, or sorry, the, the first version, the first public version of the contributor portal, um, Professor Falco and Professor Drenick were both retiring uh, in the wake of the WPI hiring freeze, uh, meaning unfortunately that their replacements couldn't be hired yet. So the JHDB was operating fully remote uh, with the help of a few volunteers, Professor Falco, Professor Drenick, uh, and a couple of students that were all really passionate about keeping the project alive. And despite these uh, obstacles, Professor Falco was able to produce over 50 published pages featuring artists and groups from over 37 countries 
Um, and this was really mind blowing. This was a feat that would have previously taken several years and a much larger team of students um, before the completion of the contributor portal. And we knew that we were automating away a lot of um, hours of manual work, but we, we didn't really realize until this point, um, like how big of an impact it really was, where we cut down literal years of work uh, down to a matter of weeks. Uh, so where we're at today, um, as of uh, a few weeks ago, actually, um, Mr. Ben Young, who is a renowned researcher, uh, historian, and teacher, has been hired as the new Jazz History Database Director. So we're super excited to, to be working with him now. Um, Professor Falcon and Professor Drenick are still involved with the Jazz History Database in an advisory capacity, but they've finally been able to, to retire and step away from the day-to-day -day work. Professor Doug Olson has taken over the JHDB Enquiry Seminar, uh, which is offered twice a year and allows WPI students as part of their coursework to make meaningful contributions directly to the online museum. And where previously these students would have um, taken the physical materials and digitized them and they'd kind of sit in the queue for the website builders. Now these students are able to build the pages themselves and contribute them directly to the museum. Um, and have that page like online and public by the end of the of the seminar. I'm now, uh, of, oh, of course, student workers are still a critical part of the JHDB. We haven't put any students out of work, but their skills are now being better utilized on design and technical work that really needs to be done by hand. Um, I'm now working part time with the Jazz History Database, maintaining and expanding the contributor portal and providing technical support to the JHDB term in my fourth and fifth year here at WPI. And Lucas, who's graduated uh, and now works full-time as a software engineer, is still involved in, on an as-needed basis as a volunteer. So um, in the words of Professor Falco, it's not an understatement to say that this is truly a new era for the Jazz History Database. Um, the JHDB in its current state is the culmination of over 20 years of dedicated research. And this project really paves the way for expanding that research and opening up to a plethora of new opportunities for academic work. Um, ranging from infrastructure improvements. There's a lot of old content and old technology such as Adobe Flash Player that are still present uh, and that content needs to be migrated and updated um, and some of it revamped. And of course, uh, some more cutting edge research where future generations of WPI students um, might be doing MQPs, IQPs or independent studies, uh, improving the tools and infrastructure to facilitate the design work. Uh, and we also have an upcoming MQP with the IMGD department slated to build an actual interactive museum uh, where you can walk through a virtual physical museum, if you will, and see some of these materials. To conclude, uh, we'd just like to thank a few uh, really passionate individuals uh, who, uh, without whom we wouldn't, uh, you know, we, we, we would really uh, be in a different spot. Uh, we would like to thank Professor Charlie Roberts from the CS and IMGD departments uh, for advising our first proof of concept all the way back in 2019. Uh, Professor Mike Dernick for maintaining the JHDB Online Museum from a technical perspective all the way since its beginning um, about 20 years ago. Uh, Tom Bellino, uh, who is the JHDB Global Correspondent and uh, Ben Young, who is the current JHDB Director recently hired. We'd also like to give a huge thanks to Professor Keith Zizza from the IMGD department, who was an outstanding advisor and really supported this project um, in, in all aspects start to finish. Um, we'd like to thank the, uh, the Global School for giving us the opportunity to share this story. Um, it, I think it's a super cool story. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, we'd like to give a huge thanks to Professor Falco and to the Jazz History Database team. Professor Falco has really been the driving, uh, the driving force behind the JHDB since the start. Um, and we'd like to close off with a quick anecdote. So just the other day, actually, we learned that the Jazz History Database was started out of a theater closet in Alden Hall, believe it or not, over 20 years ago. And Professor Falco, driven by his vision of preserving fading history uh, in the New England jazz scene, pulled out all the old props and costumes, uh, painted the room himself. And 20 years later, this passion project is well on its way to becoming the Global Jazz Museum. Uh, and we're extremely proud and grateful to have had a meaningful part in that. Okay, yeah, we'd love to take your questions now. Thank you very much. Great. Hey, Jeremy. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is this is Jeremy. Uh, great work, guys. Uh, so you, you said 20 years ago this 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 project started, and I was a student at WPI at that exact time. And actually, 
uh, helped out in the first versions of the Jazz History Database. And it looks nothing like what you guys presented here, which is just <laughs> phenomenal to see 20 years ahead. And I think really embodies what WPI is about taking uh, technology astute, engineering astute, uh, people and then applying them to human social questions because of the cultural richness that jazz embodies uh, as as really an American uh, music, and uh, you know I could couldn't be more proud to see that that work because as as Professor Rich Falco was saying it's it's the Count Basies and and the Ellingtons they're they're captured but so many of the local regional artists that, that played such an influential role in the cultural shaping of, of, of their respective homes um, is really the cusp of being lost. And like the, you know, WPI has a huge collection of, of Charles Dickens uh, work and being able to, to take world-class technologists to these human social problems is, is really exciting. And um, it, it's remarkably difficult to, to do that preservation work. So um I guess my question is, I mean, how it, it, are we seeing other regions starting to use use this? I mean, this, you're, you're, I heard the word national so many times. So can, can you talk about some of the national uh, aspects with it now? Yeah, um, that, that's a good question. Um, so I guess we, we kind of threw the number out there a couple of times, but um, of the content that was produced over the summer following the, the project that's now on uh, global.jazzhistorydatabase.com, uh, we have contributions from, uh, I believe, over 37 countries. That number might actually be outdated now because there's just an ongoing flow of content. Um, so so it's, it's really crazy just scrolling through the page. I, I mean, in the slides, we kind of dropped the map in there and you could see just like points all over the place. So it's really not just national, but international, um, like people from, from all over the world, um, like musicians, scholars that are uh, like just just dying to get their their content and and share their local regional history with with the world, um, and and the jazz history database is giving them the opportunity to do that. Very cool. Thank you. Who else has a question? Well, I was I was playing with it and uh, listening to Paul Broadnax because I used to go to clubs and hear him live, so that was pretty cool um, just being able to see him captured like that. I've not seen him captured anywhere. Um, how, how hard has it been to kind of get, you know, reach to people who are content providers, curators, and then convince them to use this app to, to upload and, and share information? Sure. So I, I guess I can I can speak a bit to that since that's part of the ongoing efforts that are happening um, right now. Uh, so as as we mentioned, Tom Bellino uh, is the the JHDB Global correspondent. So it's really uh, really just getting in contact with people that are that are very well connected within the jazz community. Um, previously, Professor Falco has has kind of filled that role, but um, we have. Uh, I mean, like we mentioned, there's already a number of people lined up. Um, we've uh, I, I've talked to, with Professor Falco uh, in the past months. They're planning on doing a much larger outreach effort um, via like jazz jazz magazines and and other um, jazz publications. So so really reaching out directly to to members of the community via those channels. Um, I I think that. Um, Honestly, if anything, we've, we've been uh, more concerned about making sure that, that our tool can scale to the number of people that are interested in using it than, than worried about getting people on board because there's really just, uh, there's really just so much interest. And um, every time we talk to Professor Falco about it, um, like we can really see the excitement in his eyes and he's like, wow, like there's, yeah, I, I honestly, I don't know that I have a, a good grasp of it myself. Um, like it's just a really, a really big community, and um, yeah, I, I hope that answered the question. Can you talk a little bit about the very beginnings of this project? It just feels like, I mean, I think about impact, and uh, like you totally transformed the potential of this thing, which is amazing. But you know, early on, was it? Like we want to figure out a better way, but we really don't know what we would even want. And like, how much of this came? was sort of well laid out versus how much did you all really come up with? You know, here's what we think is really needed here to blow the doors on it, you know? Great. Uh, yeah, I can I can sort of speak to that a little bit. Uh, so uh, 
in, you know, really this this sort of uh, the need for something like this from the Jesuit Street database, uh, from the international correspondence perspective, began uh, in around 2018 when uh, when Professor Paco uh, started to uh, be able to reach people from some of the different countries rather you know rather than just being um, within contained within the new england bubble we started to expand um uh the outreach and eventually reached uh you know people internationally uh but also there was you know like uh myself being a uh, part of the student builder or student worker uh team that, that worked on the website itself you know like, um, i also knew there was a lot of uh necessity uh for for something that would do this kind of work fast, uh, you know, so that so that even us from from the JHDB team ourselves could could even try to use it. So our primary objective was to to uh, look at international out outreach, but eventually uh, we realized we we're really making this a tool for everyone. Uh, and this is this is unique in that uh, not not a lot of uh, online museums have something like this. Uh, and uh, we, you know, we really, uh, really put together a lot of different technologies that are already out there uh, in order to connect, uh, you know, people who have already access to their own uh, you know, digitization technology. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm not, not sure if I answered your question, but uh, but this took many, many iterations because we, we realized we, in, we were serving a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds. Yeah, and in terms of what was laid out for us already, um, honestly, the short answer is not much. Uh, in terms of the technology, we really started from scratch and we looked into a lot of different options early on. Uh, we looked, of course, at what out of the box solutions um, might work. Uh, Lucas mentioned the, the determined dependent study where, uh, where we sort of did the proof of concept. And originally we thought that we were gonna be building the whole thing in, in the one term. Um, and we kind of rescoped it as, as a technical proof of concept where we were like, okay, uh, this technology sort of works and sort of does what we, what we needed to do. And then from that, uh, it, it turned into preparation for, for this IQP, which was the much larger scale project to, to actually produce the thing. Thank you. Kent, are we at our break time? We are at our break time. Thank you all. Um, we're going to take 15 minutes about, maybe 13 minutes, come back at 3.30 for two more presentations. So allow people to stand up, move around, turn off their cameras if they want for a few, uh, and we'll see shortly. Very good.
afternoon. We'll continue now with the two remaining presentations. And since it's taken us sometimes a moment to get them started, I'll, I'll even jump in here a minute early and say the fourth presentation uh, comes from also the Albania Project Center. It is Memorialization of the Spotch Labor Camp, an investigation into digital methods. Students on the project were Michael Clements, Leo Gross, Elizabeth Kirshner, and the fourth student, Zeta Rajanimi, Rajanimi uh, is not present with us today, but was certainly a contributor to the project. The advisors for this team were, again, Professor Bob Knicki and Bob Hirsch. We are the. Hey, I think you should be all set to get started. I'm having technical issues. All right. Uh, you've disabled my video. spoke to me sorry that was leo oh leo okay um spotlight so leo it you should be able to share yep hello uh i am leo gross i'm joined by michael clements and elizabeth kirshner um, our iqp was the memorialization of the spot labor camp and investigation into digital methods completed our project with the help of Cultural Heritage Without Borders Albania, an Albanian non-government organization, and we're excited to present our work to you today. An exemplar of the communist regime brutality sits crumbling on a remote mountainside in Mirdata, one of the poorest regions of Albania. Now abandoned Spoch prison was once a forced labor camp. The regime sent common criminals and political prisoners to Spoch to work in the copper mine. Poets and journalists served long sentences for agitation and propaganda, side by side with those convicted of violent crimes. Spotch prison was a large compound spot spanning two hillsides and holding more than a thousand prisoners. Four decades. Four decades. Four decades of the oppressive dictatorship which created Spotch shaped recent Albanian history and personal life. Researchers argue that this time has far reaching implications for Albanian society. Particularly, there is no cultural consensus on the impact of the regime. For the descendants of the oppressed, it was a time of hardship, governed by an insane dictator. For others, there's a sentiment that, at the very least, all were equal then. Organizations like the International Coalition for Sites of Conscience and CHWB believe Spotch has immense potential for fostering dialogue. Spotch encompasses a large area, not even entirely captured in these pictures. However, modern conditions have been extremely hard on the compound. The copper mine is still in use. When you visit the site, you can actually hear the dull hum of construction machinery. Since closing, it has fallen into this advanced state of decay. The photo on the left is from the 70s, while the one on the right is from present day. And you can see some buildings are completely gone, circled here, and here, and here. Spotch embodies the damaged lines of communication in Albania. While it serves as a cultural monument, a tool for transmitting memory, it has been largely, it has been barely spared from physical destruction. To help hedge against this loss of an important piece of Albanian heritage, we explored the application of novel techniques, especially digital reconstruction, to preserve Spotch. This is Amnesty International and Forensic Architecture's digital reconstruction of the Sidnaya prison. Sidnaya is a present day Syrian prison infamous for its secretive nature. Forensic Architecture used witness testimony and satellite photos to attempt to expose the interior of Sidnaya to the broader world. Our team was quite in impressed by Forensic Architecture's model. They used a complete 3D rendering of the prison to give a sense of its scope. Forensic architecture also used labels and personal context to lend weight to the spaces they depicted. 
In addition to showing the exterior, side Niam, the side Niam model strives to take you inside. With the help of eyewitnesses, they created artistic depictions of the inside of several rooms. By clicking on different sections of the model, users can be taken to a 360 degree view of the interior and be presented with a story detailing the experiences there. They also used a technique we refer to as hotspots, small callouts within an image of a room that allow you to click and see more detailed information about portions of the space. After reading further into Forensic Architecture's methodology, we learned about a technique they use called situated testimony. To use this technique, Forensic Architecture created a preliminary version of their model and then presented it to eyewitnesses. The model is used as a prompt to help the witness remember additional details about their experience or to point out mistakes in Forensic Architecture's model. Here you can see a victim of the Syrian prison working with a CAD technician to refine the reconstruction. With the example of Forensic Architecture's work on Sidney in mind, we got straight to work upon our team's arrival in Albania. We quickly discovered relevant software frameworks such as Penelum, a 360 photo viewer, and 3JS, a library for web-based 3D rendering. Our sponsor, Cultural Heritage Without Borders, aided us in our efforts to collect relevant archival data, eyewitness testimony, and archival plans. By taking cues from Sidna, we wanted to test the impact of a similar model. We knew there would be differences, but we figured that forensic architecture's techniques would give us a good launching off point. If Sidna could show a secret Syrian prison to the general public, surely we could show a half forgotten prison to a new generation in Albania. Our sponsor provided us with English versions of their archival te witness testimony. We also created CAD models of the main cell blocks from their archival architectural plans. This sh slide shows the first CAD model we created, half of the main cell block. From there, we prepared to work with witnesses to learn more. We had the opportunity to interview Zanel Drangu, a former prisoner who served 18 years at Spach. Even more fortunately, we were able to have him guide us through the site, using it as an anchor for his testimony. Interviewing Zanel, we were struck by the power of the physical compound. Here you can see Zanel using the, the local geography to point out where things used to stand. Different rooms would prompt him to share different and powerful stories of the conditions he suffered. One of the most powerful stories was his daily experiences on the roll call platform. Zanel described to us standing and waiting to be counted twice a day, every day, for the duration of his imprisonment at Spotch. Prisoners would have to stand waiting for hours in blistering cold or burning heat. Zanel noted that this experience was particularly bad for the third mining shift that would end at eight in the morning. Those prisoners, he told us, would have to wait on the platform for hours after their shift had ended to be counted. Once they were counted, the shift would only have a few hours of sleep before they would be, they had to wait, wake up for their lunch. This cruelty, he told us, was well outside the official rules and re regulations that Spatch was supposed to un operate under. As a result of hearing Zanel's story, our team decided to take a much broader look at our uh, current approach to our digital reconstruction. While Side Naya is a reconstruction of just one building, Spotch was comprised of many buildings spanning a large portion of steep mountainous terrain. Our team also noted that a significant portion of Zanel's stories and memories took place outside in, or in buildings that have since been reduced to rubble. We now knew the site was much more than just the buildings. Architectural models alone, even with powerful eyewitness testimony, were not enough to capture the complexity of Spotch's history. And so we turn to Sidnaya again. At this point, we noted their choice to use a satellite photo as the background. In this case, it was a very powerful choice. It lent context to this Syrian prison. We decided to superimpose several buildings we created in CAD over a 2D photograph of the compound. But as we looked at it and remembered our experience touring the compound with Zanel, it felt fundamentally inadequate. How could this flat photograph capture the rugged terrain of Spotch? Even a massive satellite image couldn't give you a sense of the remoteness and isolation that the prison embodied for those who live there. And so we created something new. We created terrain to take in the impressiveness of the landscape around it with some artistic liberties to emphasize such as the valley in front of the prison and the hills and mountains behind. So this is our result. We modeled the standing buildings within the main compound of Spanish prison. We placed our scaled buildings onto their corresponding places in the terrain using satellite data and architectural diagrams provided by CHWB. 
Barred artistic techniques from Sadam Naya, such as a light transparency to the buildings that gives you a sense of their internal structure. Since the Nell shared the cruelty of being forced to stand out in the blazing heat or freezing cold for hours on end, decide that was necessary for a model to present outdoor spaces. To this end, we added clickable signifiers that a user could select to inform them about specific outdoor places in the garage. Finally, given the power of Zanel's story about the now ruined roll call platform, we decided to try our hand at the reconstruction of a destroyed building. From archival photos and measurements of the standing ruins, we were able to make a relatively accurate portrayal of a crucial roll call platform. And on the above, you can see what the roll call platform looked like in the 1970s. Below, you can see what remains today, broken down walls. You can click on an outdoor signifier and bring you to a different kinds of pages. This one is a 360 degree photo page detailing the family meeting area. Inside this page, you can click on a hotspot, which will bring you to different stories that happened in this space. To increase accessibility of our design, we also blended different kinds of pages, such as this two photo page. Here you can see examples showing different propaganda that can be seen around the compound. At this point, we felt like we had a pretty strong model. One day, our translator actually came in and asked if he could take a picture of it to show to his friends. So we had hope, but we weren't sure that our model could really facilitate a conversation about history. Would it encourage viewers to share their own stories or relate to this model in some deep way? Fortunately for us, we had a great opportunity to test this. Fabian Kati, who served three years in Spach in the early 1980s, was visiting Tirana. We met with him in CHWB's downtown office, and we decided to try forensic architecture's technique called situated testimony with him. This interview started off as one normally would. We sat with Fabian and asked him to share his story. As a film director, Fabian is a talented storyteller. He was quick to pull us into the story. He reminded us that he was our age when he was first arrested. His crime, classified as agitation and propaganda, had been plotting to leave the country. While we had been free, if not encouraged by this program to leave the country, when he had so much as planned his escape, he was sent to a labor camp. Fabian shared some of his details about his time there, but as he began to slow down, we presented him with our prototype. He sat there, uncertain what to do for a moment. When we showed him that he could click and, move, click and drag to move the model, he launched off into storytelling with renewed zeal. He guided us through the site using his mouse cursor to lead us on a tour. His cell block was entirely absent from our model. It had been demolished long ago. Nonetheless, using our terrain, he was able to trace out where he used to live and the shape of the destroyed bridge he used to cross. We were impressed by how Fabian's use of our, the prototype mirrored Zanel's use of the physical site. He referred to specific locations in our model 102 times during our brief interview. Further, at one point, he traced his cursor over the pathway into the compound. At this point, he shared with us that he had forgotten to mention his experience arriving at Spotch. He had felt a mixture of emotions because despite the terrifying prospect of being interred in this labor camp, it was a relief to get out of the windowless box van where he had been cramped with several other prisoners for multiple hours on the ride to Spotch. We were impressed with just how well our model facilitated situated testimony and helped Fabian recall details and make concrete his memories. Finally, we asked Fabian what he thought about the model and he was grateful for the work we were doing. While he was disappointed that the dimensions of his cell block had been lost to time, he believed our model could play a real role in the transmission of the memory of the suffering he faced to a new generation of Albanian youth. Following the success of our interview with Fabian, we knew it was time to share our prototype with a new generation of Albanians. We developed a survey that was originally designed to measure the usability of the software we had created, but our team ended up discovering something much more interesting. When presented with our model, users were quick to begin relating to it. They shared emotions of curiosity, horror, and sadness. But perhaps more importantly, they started sharing personal stories. One of our respondents shared that he had heard similar stories about family visitation from his great uncle. Another shared that their mother's family was persecuted, meaning both of their grandparents spent time in prison. Another additional goal of our survey was to ascertain whether or not our model was generating interest in the physical site. After viewing and interacting with our model, an overwhelming 83% of our respondents expressed an interest to physically visit Spach. 
When asked why, this is what one respondent had to say. So we left Albania and we left CHWB with a few recommendations. The first one would be to have an Albanian language toggle such that it could be more accessible and more accessible to uh, Albanian only speakers. As well, a more accurate and detailed model of the terrain, the ruggedness and the steep clear cliff faces that we had created still we felt didn't capture enough and continual work would had to be done. And as well, continuing modeling and reconstructing buildings such as Zanel's isolation cell and the free worker buildings. A full year later, and a lot has happened. CHWB ended up hiring a firm to complete our recommendations. One advantage this firm had over us was the fact that they were native speakers of Albanian. For this reason, they were able to easily implement a solid toggle feature for Albanian and English. They were also able to reconstruct the infamous isolation cells where Zanel suffered some of the harshest cruelties, as signified by this arrow. With their additional time and effort, they modernized the design and captured much of the look and feel of Side Naya. They also added labels to various buildings. Finally, a WPI MQP team took up the mantle. Specialists in both computer science and IMGD, they studied the usability of the existing model. They targeted reducing load times to help the model perform better on the slow internet common in parts of Albania. And also they added a fog effect, softening the edge of the model for a more immersive experience. They performed a user test and confirmed that they had significantly improved the usability of the model as a whole. With these technical barriers getting more and more put to rest, the potential of the Spotch Prison website is immense. We hope that this reconstruction continues to facilitate dialogue around Spotch. Our experience with situated testimony gives us faith that there is great power in the continual improvement of a digital reconstruction. First of all, we'd like to thank the faculty and staff that made this project possible. Without the IGSD, we would have never been granted the opportunity to do this work. We'd also like to thank our respective programs. If Leo didn't have a working knowledge of CAD from the Department of Mechanical Engineering, we wouldn't have been able to produce all the 3D models we did. If Elizabeth and I didn't have our working knowledge of creation of software systems, courtesy of the Department of Computer Science, we wouldn't have hit the ground running and made a prototype strong enough in time for testing. And of course, Elizabeth's experience with the IMTG program helped us time and time again as we tried to understand the human aspect of our design. And of course, we'd like to thank the individuals who made this product possible. Our advisors, our site directors, our contacts at our sponsors, but perhaps most importantly, Fabian Kati and Zanel Drangu. Their willingness to revisit the hardships they face in the service of wrestling with history was inspiring. We hope that all the work so far and the work still to come helps the world hear the harrowing stories they shared so well. We'd like to open the floor to questions. Thank you very much. Oh, that's great. What a totally fascinating project. Just such a great integration of technology and humanity. I, I uh, and with so much potential to, for application all over the world. Um, judges, who wants to jump in? Just have two quick questions here. So one, uh, any efforts to maintain the physical structure? Are, are there any ongoing efforts to do that? And then, and then two, did CHWB give you a sense of how they will use the model? Is it uh, for educational purposes? Is it, is it to increase tourism to the physical structure? Do you get a sense of that? So for the, for the first question, yes, there have been efforts to maintain the structure. In 2017, our sponsor CHWB performed some structural interventions on the site. That's actually where the architectural plans we use to create the CAD models came from. Um, in terms of their planned use for the model, They've been interested in bringing it into schools and universities to spawn conversations in the classroom, although they definitely hope that it will create interest in the site itself. The site being only a few kilometers from Albania's most modern highway, they believe it has a lot of potential, um, has a lot of underused potential 
in terms of a physical tourist destination. I can't help but wonder, thank you so much for, for the presentation. I can't help but wonder what impact did this have on you, particularly as you listen to Fabian's story, knowing that he was about your age when he was imprisoned. I mean, how, you know, what, what was that impact like? It was, it was a harrowing experience for me. Um, Fabian was very good at, at building that rapport and making his, making the difficulty he faced clear. Um, I think it's caused me to reflect a lot on institutions in the United States. I mean, we'd like to alienate you know, this regime as a boogeyman, totally unlike what happens here. But there are harsh prisons in the United States. There are people in the United States in jail for the crime of trying to leave their country for a better life today. So I, I try and carry Fabian's lessons with me to the extent that I'm able. Elizabeth, did you want to jump in too? I, I, I'd love to add also, you know, um, in the interview with Zanel, I felt for me, you know, the most powerful moment almost for me of the whole experience in Albania was at the very end of that interview, you know, Zanel turned to me directly and, you know, hand over his heart and tears in his eyes, thanked us for listening and, you know, telling his story. And, you know, even though this interview was conducted, you know, through an interpreter that, you know, there was this language barrier, but there was sort of a moment of true connection where, you know, he was speaking straight to me and I could feel the power of, you know, his emotion and his experience in that moment. And I would say overall, that was, you know, just the hugest moment that, you know, sense of feeling like we were doing something that this really mattered to someone and that we were bettering, the, um, you know, Zanel's life. So do you think in the future, is someone in Albania going to pick up this project and continue on with it? I mean, there's a lot more work to do. Obviously, you could expand this model forever. I mean, thousands of people spent time at Spaj. It will never contain all of their stories. But CHWB has shown dedication to putting effort and even money into the improvement of this model. So I'd say we have pretty good faith that this product is going to continue and it's going to have ongoing impact. Fascinating to think about the, I just bought um, uh, one of these Oculus headsets, right? The immersive VR and, uh, and you, just the idea that you could sort of really make real the experience, um, even with just the website that you have, which I played with today. Um, but even making it more immersive. Did you all talk about this idea of, of doing even more immersive experiences? Once you build the model, you should be able to. Uh, we, we, we did discuss VR briefly in our time there. We knew it was difficult to do well. And actually the previous IQP team that had worked with CHWB did some exploration of VR in limited spaces. What we were concerned about though was improving spaces with testimony, which we couldn't find an easy way to do in VR. We thought it was really vital to have Zanel and Fabian's words side by side with the imagery, which is something that would definitely be worth exploring in a VR space. I totally agree with that choice though. It's about not just the place, but the people. Yeah, yeah very, very interesting guys and, and congrats. Uh, I was curious, you're, you're thinking of other uh, uh, places of prisons that are that are tourist attractions and, and uh, destinations that people go to, uh, you know, Alcatraz is an example, but uh, Mandela was was on Nelson Island. Um, uh, obviously, the the Holocaust. I, I mean, just the this the, the importance of storytelling around this, and just kind of, I don't know if any of you have visited one before, but just thinking about how how. In Albania, obviously, this is a very important location in, in their local world. But as you think about these centers uh, in America and other places, I, I guess how how transferable is the work that you're doing from capturing the physical place and the stories to other locations? And and I guess what did you what did you learn from that, or what advice do you have uh, for for other locations? So um, I'll share my screen real quick, and I think Clemens can talk about this. Ah. So another model we had studied during the course of our IQP was the Auschwitz digital reconstruction. 
Um, it's a very powerful model. You can really get a harrowing sense. Auschwitz has been addressed in film and in many other media, but this digital reconstruction we found powerful. The reason we didn't draw as many techniques from this is because whereas Auschwitz, the horror of this model really comes from just like the, the mechanization, these like repeated rows of identical houses, the, the scale of this machine for mass slaughter. In the case of Spaj, there was this, there was this sense of terrain, the sense of, op of outdoors, outdoorness almost for the model. Um, so we were kind of excited to realize that we were adding a new technique to the tool case of digital reconstructors. We really hadn't seen terrain used much in the presentation of sites of conscience. So we're kind of, you know, in the case of Alcatraz, right, the terrain, the island itself would be an important part of what made the Alcatraz experience the way it was. So we're hopeful that the work we did in digital reconstruction might actually contribute towards making it a viable technique for presenting even more spaces. Fascinating. Wow, thank you. Any other questions? If not, we can certainly thank the team. Yes. Uh, it's a very compelling presentation. Absolutely. We have a couple minutes before four o'clock, so I, I want to sort of wait for the audience in case people are tuning in for the four o'clock presentation. So um, if you want to take, again, just a few minutes, you can turn off the cameras and we'll be back. Yes, stretch your legs. We'll be right back. Great job.
Okay, we have the last group ready. Can you guys see the screen? We see the screen. Fantastic. Is everything ready to go for us? I believe it is. No, so just one moment, please. I need to get. Uh... OK, you're all set. All right. Presentation coming from Paul Bonarigo, Matt Iaconis, Ryan Johnson, and Brendan McCann. You can see it right there. It's using behavior change strategies to reduce littering in Lambeth in England. Go ahead, guys. Paul, I believe you're muted. Thank you. OK, can you hear me now? Yep. Perfect. OK. So yes, just to reiterate, we are using behavior change strategies to reduce littering in Lambeth. I'm Paul Bonarigo. I'm Matt Iaconis. I'm Ryan Johnson. And I'm Brandon McCann. Lambeth Council sponsored our project and hoped that we could create methods to change people's behaviors towards littering. Yeah, so we got to go to London last C term, so we got out just in time. Um, so we mainly worked in Lambeth, and Lambeth is an inner London borough. It's home to roughly 325,000 residents, which makes it the fifth most populated of London's boroughs. Um, it's located just south of the River Thames and has some um, widely recognizable London landmarks, such as the London Eye, um, the London Aquarium, as well as South Bank Center. And then specifically, while we were there, we worked with Lambeth Council's Highways and Environmental Enforcement Team, and they're specifically in charge of um, littering and sort of litter reduction and litter enforcement and everything to do with that in the area. So before we can begin our project, we first had to understand what makes littering such an important issue to address. First of all, it's unattractive. I think that we can all agree on that. But specifically, 81% of British people report feeling frustrated or angry at the sight of urban litter. It has also been shown to reduce tourism, which is especially important in Lambeth, which is home to attractions such as the London Eye. Litter is very expensive, costing the British taxpayer upwards of 500 million pounds each year to clean their streets and over 7 million pounds in Lambeth alone. Litter has very negative impact on our environment. It can be carried by runoff and contaminate our water systems. It can alter and obstruct habitats and endanger wildlife. And dangerous chemicals that are carried by litter can enter the food chain, which could potentially even lead back to humans. Finally, litter is a burden to society by damaging community spirit and health. And over a three year span, it was responsible for over 120 hours of delays to the London Underground Network. Okay, so now let's look at behavior change strategies for litter reduction. There are two major motivations, these being identity motivations and environmental motivations. Identity motivations include things like accountability and community involvement. Accountability, as seen in the Love Essex campaign on the top left side of the screen, uses is where you use words like your to make people feel accountable for their actions. This is so they will hopefully rethink them and change their behaviors over time. Also, this builds into community involvement where these people that feel accountable will help the campaign's actual entire ideas spread as they will both clean up litter, but also they will spread the word to people they know. Next are environmental motivations. Examples of these are advertisements and bin design and appearance. The Love Essex campaign is also an advertisement. These are extremely effective because over time as people see them, they will constantly get the ideas reminded to them and they will either consciously or subconsciously change their ways over time. This can be seen by the Love Exit campaign, being able to decrease littering by 41% in only three years. And then finally, you have bin design and appearance, as seen by the ballot bin campaigns in the top right. These campaigns were very effective as they gave smokers the option to vote on a question such as, do you like pineapple on pizza? By, posting, by placing their cigarette butts in the left or right side of the bins. This was able to decrease cigarette butt litter by 46% and shows that by simply changing someone's environment, just like an interesting bin like this, you can make them think about what they're doing more and get them to not litter. Ultimately, all these motivations were brought into our final project. And the goal of this project was to develop and test an implementable anti-littering strategy that will assist Lambeth Council in addressing the problem of excessive littering in their borough. 
So in order to achieve this project goal, we divided into four objectives. The first objective was to assess and understand individuals' attitudes towards littering within the London Borough of Lambeth. Our second objective was to characterize litter uh, in the borough uh, by observing it. So these two objectives fed our third objective, which was to design and test methods of preventing littering. And finally, that led to our fourth objective, which was to deliver a litter reduction plan that Lambeth Council could use after we left. So for our first objective, we distributed a survey to residents and visitors in the borough. And the goal of this was to measure the attitudes and understand the opinions of these people. Uh, this survey you know, was multiple choice. Uh, it took roughly five minutes for uh, people to complete. And all told, we received 80 responses. Uh, this was a mixed media survey we distributed on paper by canvassing the streets. We distributed through a council internal website for the employees. We distributed it through an email blast and on the council's public facing Twitter page. So from the survey results, we extracted a few trends that were really important for later in our campaign. First off, we noted that people widely saw litter on the street uh, near public transportation hubs and businesses, uh, which was important because it kind of showed to us uh, the hot spots for littering that we would target. We also saw that people uh, specifically wanted more litter bins, um, despite even the council adding that they had, you know, added more litter bins recently. Uh, people were supportive of public education initiatives to combat littering. And this was uh, partially in part due to the fact that many people believed that the most uh, frequent litterers were the youth within the community. Um, and everyone agreed that littering was a significant issue. But uh, we asked them also about FPNs, or which stands for fixed penalty notices. And that's the specific terminology they use for littering fines within Lambeth. Um, and most people supported the recent uh, increase in FPN prices, but um, they were pretty comfortable where they were and did not want this to go any further. So some key uh, points to take away from these results is that uh, based on where we saw littering primarily accumulating, we noticed that it was an opportunistic behavior. People tend to litter where it's convenient when they really need to just get rid of their trash and they're in a rush. Um, so adding uh, posters, which is a form of environmental nudging, we thought would be effective in order to try to sort of target this behavior right when it's about to manifest. Uh, we also saw that people blamed external factors for littering uh, much more frequently than you know, themselves. And so uh, instead, of realize, instead of just taking that at face value and thinking that littering was purely an external issue, uh, we wanted to promote a sense of ownership in the community uh, by using community attachment strategies. Um, and in order to be able to use community attachment strategies, we need to identify where um, people in the borough like really identified with. And we found out that they identified more with London rather than with Lambeth or within the neighborhood uh, within Lambeth. So for our targeted campaign, we would use more widely recognizable uh, features of Lambeth or just London centric messaging in general. So our next objective was to characterize the littering problem in Lambeth. We did this by observing and interviewing civil enforcement officers or CEOs, the people tasked with citing litters with those FPNs. We wanted to learn more about their job and their experience with litter to help us further understand Lambus littering dynamics and use this information to refine our campaign. What we found is that litter happens when and where there's a lot of foot traffic, for instance, around transportation hubs, restaurants, and meal times. We also found that cigarette ends or cigarette butts are the most common form of litter. We learned that FPNs alone were not enough to change the behavior of people who litter but many officers recommended advertising these high prices along with other anti-littering policy to act as a good deterrent. And finally, we found that many smokers were improperly disposing their cigarettes due to lacking in the current bin or ashtray design. But many CEOs agreed with our hypothesis that improving this design could help reduce litter. So this information led us to updating the focus of our campaign on three different underground stations, Brixton, Waterloo, and Vauxhall, as shown here in the map. On two different times of day, the morning commute and the lunch rush chosen for being times of high foot traffic and to focus specifically on cigarette ends. So this brings us to our observational studies of littering behavior. Each of our three lo locations, we assigned one specific day of the week and two hours of the day to coincide with high foot traffic in order to be able to repeat our studies after implementing our campaign. 
at each station, we would outline a zone just outside the entrance that included two to three litter bins. And then our team would separate to either end. And for one hour, we would observe people smoking in and around our zone and tally the total number of cigarettes that were disposed of properly, meaning that they were extinguished and deposited in a bin or ashtray. Improperly, meaning that they were put into a bin when they were still lit or simply left on top of a bin only to be blown to the ground later or those that were just littered. What we found is that 45% of over 200 cigarettes we observed ended up as litter. More specifically, almost one in five smokers were improperly disposing of their cigarettes at the bin, while more than a quarter blatantly littered them on the ground. So with that, we decided to use all this information to create a poster campaign. Our campaign had three main parts. First, we wanted to target community attachment. We did this by using words like our and also having pictures such as the London Eye seen in our posters on the left. This again, made people feel accountable for the uh, trash they're putting on the ground and made them realize that their effect was not only, their litter was not only affecting them, but it was affecting the entire community. Then we post the FPN price. This is seen in the black box in the bottom left. This box not only had our slogan, ash it and trash it, to explain to smokers what they should do when they want to get rid of their cigarettes, but it also showed the negative repercussions, the fine of 150 pounds if they did not do so. Finally, we use recognizable imagery. This is shown by the London Eye picture once again, but also the international tidy man above that black box and also the Lambeth logo on the bottom right. We thought that this would give the whole entire poster a sense of legitimacy and hope that more people would take it seriously when they saw it. As you can also see on the right side, we have these triangle bin toppers. We added these as we saw the amount of improper disposals were interesting. And we thought that a specific sticker that we put on top of the bin that was able to point at the locations where one should ash and trash their cigarettes might helpfully decrease that number. Here are the actual posters on the trash cans. You can see that the pink and blue colors we use really contrast in the black of the trash can as we really hope that it would be more eye-catching to those looking by. Also, you can see different images used as the Electric Avenue on the left poster. These were used specifically to be more relevant to the locations these litter bins were actually placed in London. And then finally, as you can see on the right bin, on the top of it, you can actually see our triangle bin topper with the specific arrows to the left and right where the stubber plates are and the bottom to where the receptacle is for the actual cigarettes as we hope this would be more effective. Then we ran our observational studies again. We found that 27% of all 186 discarded cigarettes ended up as litter. This being a breakdown of 16% littered, 11% improper disposal. And Brendan will get more into the breakdown of those numbers. Yeah, so how effective was our campaign? Well, we calculated a 39% reduction in the amount of cigarettes that ended up as litter. That was from 45 in the baseline down to 27 post campaign. And then to sort of back up this huge correlation, we made our own observations of, of sort of how people interacted with our posters and sort of how they were perceived by the public. So with the bin topper specifically, sure there was a couple of smokers who stubbed out their cigarettes and just still left them on top of the bin. Um, in one instance, even leading them right on top of our um, bin topper sticker. However, a handful of times and more often, it seemed like smokers were learning from our bin toppers. And what I mean by this is they would sort of walk up to the bin with their cigarette in hand they'd appear to be, their eyes would appear to be fixated on the bin topper. And then they would slowly stub out their cigarette and very hesitantly throw that stubbed out cigarette into the trash. And we think the key is in that hesitation, which suggests that they were a little bit unsure of what they were doing and perhaps learning, um, but ultimately they did do it correctly. And then we will mention that since we were only there for seven weeks, there was just a couple of variables in our study that we couldn't really hold constant. So the first one being the weather. During um, some studies, it was raining or drizzling which would have affected who was out and about smoking as well as where they were smoking. And the second variable would be the presence of civil enforcement officers. So when they were on the scene, especially actively giving out tickets, um, it made would-be litterers less likely to litter to try and avoid those fines. Um, but ultimately we believe that our campaign was effective. And with that, we're gonna move on to our fourth and final objective, which was to deliver these recommendations to Lambeth Council. So we came up with five total recommendations um, and the first recommendation was based on, on the results of our advertisement campaign and give some suggestions as they sort of, because they were sort of looking to do an, an advertisement campaign of their own. So for their poster design, we recommended that they build off their residence community attachment um, and also post the price of FPNs. Um, and we thought our bin toppers were effective and we recommend they use those. Um, they could even engrave them into the stubber plates as shown in the image on the bottom right there. And then we thought that they should have officers um, 
start to enforce, whether that be by tickets or, um, or fines or uh, just sort of education, um, these improper disposals, because ultimately those cigarettes are only gonna end up on the ground and contribute to the problem. And then for locations, we recommended the same high foot traffic locations like around major transportation hubs. Um, and then for our second recommendation, we looked into the bin design. So we found two main bin designs around Lambeth. Um, the bin design on the left was found mostly around Brixton. Um, this bin has is sort of a streamlined design. It's got two compartments, one for trash, one for recycling. However, the holes to these compartments are kind of small. So trash often got jammed inside these um, sort of openings, making the bin appear full, even when it wasn't. This bin also had an ashtray, which was good. However, the ashtray had very small holes, making it very difficult for smokers to get their cigarettes all the way inside and often just led to a pile of cigarettes um, right on top of the bin, as you can see in that image there on the left. Um, the bin on the right was found around Waterloo and Vauxhall. Um, this is an easy to use sort of open design bin. However, we found that in some instances, it was almost too open, where on a windy day, the wind would sort of get into the bin and blow that trash from inside back out onto the streets. Um, this bin had a stubber plate. However, um, there was no uh, ashtray, so smokers often left their cigarettes on top and they just blew on the ground as shown in that image there. So we recommended that they sort of do the best of both of these designs. And we found sort of a, a pretty good example outside of another, um, um, at another bin outside of another London borough, which was Islington, which is actually the borough we stayed in. Um, this bin has two compartments like the Brixton bin and they're a little more open. However, they're not too open where we don't think wind will be a huge problem. Um, this bin has stubber plates and really the big main feature is it's got that wide open, easy to access ashtray, giving smokers really no, no reason for not getting their cigarettes all the way stubbed out. So based on some of the survey responses we saw where people complained about a lack of litter bins, and then based on our observations during the observational studies, we noticed that instead of maybe adding more litter bins, the council could get a little more mileage out of the bins they already had. So in this bottom right picture, you can see kind of three bins clustered. And this was pretty, this is an example of what we would see elsewhere in the borough. Um, spreading these bins out to the location uh, marked with the red X would not only uh, provide more coverage for the same number of bins, but it would also move bins into the higher uh, traffic areas, such as right in front of the Vauxhall uh, underground station, which is that entrance with the little glass overhang in the picture. It's also worth noting that when it rains, uh, the smokers would typically go towards the, uh, the walls of buildings because there's overhangs uh, to try to stay out of the rain. And we also noticed that very rarely were there ashtrays or litter bins placed near the edges of buildings. So during rainy uh, weather, which is extremely common in London, you would end up getting um, piles of cigarettes near the uh, walls since uh, smokers wouldn't want to go walk out and uh, place them in the bins. Our next recommendation is we believe that Lambeth Council should run a community cleanup event. We think this would be really useful because 54% of the residents that we interviewed showed interest in one. And also the Great British Spring Clean is able to accumulate uh, 950,000 bags of litter in only four weeks. We also think it's a fantastic idea because the Lambeth Council, if they thought that money would be a possible issue, they could look to businesses for sponsorship as we know litter is not very good for business. So they'd definitely be willing to give some money to help in the event. And then finally, we think that an educational campaign for school children could be a fantastic idea. We think that this would have two major parts. First, we'd have members of Lambeth Council actually go to the schools to educate the children on the negative, negative effects of litter. And then these children would apply that information to create campaign materials, whether this be posters that they draw themselves or possibly getting them together to paint a trash can, as we believe that these materials made by children will not only be eye catching, but also believe that it might have people might have a sweet spot for seeing this kind of stuff and they might actually change the behavior more than anything an adult could make. And ultimately, we just want to say thank you all for listening. You know, it's been a long day, and thanks for getting to the final one with us. And uh, also, a special thanks to our sponsors at Lambeth Council, Ashley Brandon, Gaynor Brown, and Andrew Skilton, and also to our WPI advisors and ID2050 professors. You guys helped so much with everything that we did, uh, John or Paul Merlone and Melissa Butler. All right, and we'll now open for questions, and I will stop my screen share. Thank you all. We'll wait for the judges to reappear here.
Drive, when you guys get it fixed in Lambeth, would you come to Fort Worth and fix it also? <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, actually, um, in all of our research, we found that even as bad as littering can seem in most of American cities, it's much, much actually less of an issue than it is in London. And that's partially due to the fact of um, like the wide public education campaigns that happened um, in like the 1950s and 60s in America. And actually in Texas, like the Don't Mess With Texas campaign specifically was one that we uh, drew a lot of our inspiration from. Yeah, I think it's worked. <laughs> so what was the reception from the from the Lambeth Council here? Did you get uh, you know a big hug or yeah? <laughs> so we actually we presented it not only to our immediate uh, sponsors and point of contact of the council, but we presented it to their supervisors and their supervisors' supervisors, and um, it was actually really well received. So they had already been toying around with the idea of making a public education campaign using posters, um, but it was kind of not really gaining much progress. It wasn't really given the resources it needed. And I think our project and showing the viability of it uh, really gave them the motivation to try to then continue that effort because um, they, they seemed very excited because they had never really run a campaign like that before in their borough. And this was the first time they had evidence that investing in something like that would have actually paid off. Yeah, I would say that room was a lot less like huggy and it was more like people wanted to get going. Like they were really excited about what was going on and what we had presented. Yeah. Was that because you had the data to really back up that the interventions worked? I just think that was a very compelling story. Yeah, it was interesting trying to gather that data. There weren't a whole lot of methods that had already been established for trying to quantify litter as it is a pretty hard to quantify a thing. So really scoping down the campaign to focus on cigarette litter, which is actually one of the more, it is kind of an interesting nuance because, you know, smoking is way more prevalent in the UK than it is here. And actually, it's probably the most widespread form of litter out there, um, really made it a lot easier to quantify the results. Yeah, also in ID 2050, we didn't originally, I don't believe we originally planned on cigarette butts. It was once we got to Lambeth, and tried to do normal litter that we realized it was going to be impossible. And so we had like a two or three hour meeting of just going over what we could do and how we're gonna have to change everything to make sure that our like results are gonna be accurate. Classic IQP story. <laughs> Usually most years I visit London and I try to visit in like week two or three where you're having that exact conversation like, oh crud, everything we planned for in ID 2050. <laughs> go in the garbage bin and we're going to start over. <laughs> uh, good job, guys. Do, do you know if those uh, those new bins were adopted and, and, you know, were there any cost considerations cited as to why they weren't widely adopted? Sure, yeah. So are you specifically referencing the bin with, like, the large ashtray on top we saw in yep. Islington? Yep. Yeah, so we did actually ask about that, and that was one of the political issues uh, sort of within the borough. So um, it turns out that there's actually a different agency responsible for placing the bins that is external and private and not actually under direct control by Lambeth Council. So it was much more difficult for them to add more bins or even change the bin design as really it would amount to them giving another organization, uh, I believe their name was APCOA, a sort of just a suggestion. Um, so our suggestions were more focused around how we could use the existing bins they had and just kind of spruce them up and make them uh, more useful without actually sinking more capital into it. Thanks. I found it interesting that I know that, I mean, I've heard of applications in the United States where uh, there's an attempt to gamify um, disposing of litter to help encourage people to do that. And it's it's striking that that this seems like such a straightforward kind of approach. We're gonna do posters and 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 labels on you know on trash bins. What what did you think about like gamifying or gamification and, and what happened if you know with some of the other thoughts that you might have had? Yeah, uh, so I can definitely speak to that. One of the first um, things we were looking at were those ballot bins, if you recall from one of our early slides. So that was the bin for cigarette disposal with the two little holes. 
Um, and we were actually looking at seeing if we could create one of those or how what it would cost the council to actually add them, specifically in the zones that we noticed a lot of smoking, like outside of underground stations. Um, unfortunately, those bins were actually very expensive. And um, at, when we arrived in Lambeth, realizing kind of the budgetary constraints for the project, uh, we had to kind of put that aside. Um, but it's certainly one of the things that did strike the people we were presenting to when we showed them those litter bins because they had never seen them before and they thought they were a very, very cool idea. Um, so I think perhaps just showing the simple benefit of the poster uh, could give the council kind of the impetus they need to maybe put a little more money behind it, um, especially seeing how much just a little bit of money for posters can really, you know, do a, make a lot of change. I have a question about if you've seen uh, or been in touch with them. I mean, obviously with COVID, it's probably hard to find a before and after, but uh, you know, litter and and cleanliness and and just uh, civic civic quality. I mean, that, that's a metric that's really hard to capture. And just wondering if you you hear where where things are uh, with this project or or what the future may hold. Yeah, so we actually have not successfully gotten in touch with them and part partially is because a lot of the uh, environmental enforcement team has been furloughed um, due to, you know, just having to move money around in the council to basically account for COVID. I mean, COVID has definitely become their uh, primary focus being, you know, the local governing body of that whole borough. Um, and also any attempts to sort of quantify a change in uh, litter would be massively skewed by uh, lack of foot traffic in the borough currently. I mean, the underground schedule has been completely changed. Um, so the, the littering patterns have certainly changed. However, we, we feel that this is a great opportunity for them to really start planning that strategy for when they do open back up um, and ease people into it when they're starting to go outside and commute to work for the first time in a year. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So oh, just well, one other quick question: Did you did you work with any any health agencies also? Because it, it happened to deal with just with smoking, uh, and I was curious if you you had any interactions or or tips that that they saw in terms of uh, smoking smoking in public. Obviously, it's different culturally in, in different locations. In the UK is, is certainly one of falls under that. But just curious if that came up at all, either in literature or in some of your dealings with with a council. It actually did come up in some of our background research where other areas of the world, specifically, I believe New Zealand, was trying to address their litter problem by, instead of addressing the litter problem, addressing the smoking problem. And while we thought that was an interesting idea, we also found it a little out of our scope to address uh, reducing smoking in London as it was very common. Um, so our focus was on the environmental uh, nudges that we could give people before they take their cigarette. Or Got it. All right. Work. Thanks, team, Thank and you. for all Thanks, the teams uh, and advisors. Yeah, now you would hear a lot of clapping. I don't think you'll quite get that sound out of my microphone. <laughs> the judges are going to retire to a different Zoom room now, and we will rejoin you in this one in uh, perhaps 20, 25 minutes, something like that. We'll see how long they want to think about this. Thank you again. Right. Could I just? Go ahead, Bruce. I apologize. Could I just ask that if there are any advisors for all of these student groups as an attendee to stay on so that uh, we can bring them in uh, to the side of the webinar for the presentation of the awards. Thank you. We'll be back soon, but congratulations to all the teams. It was really great.
must have stopped your video. Okay.
We're coming back. Just give me one moment while I spotlight all of you. seeing quite a few of the faculty on my screen here. It's good to see good. And Paul and John and Bob and Bob and Creighton. Uh, I don't know if I missed anybody. Um, thanks for all the great work of the faculty. Absolutely. As usual, a really wonderful group of finalists. Are we set to go, Ruth? Or? No, I think we're still waiting for some of the judges. I don't see everybody on here yet. I think I'm missing Mark and Deborah. Um, Deborah said she would come, but she also said she had to another obligation. And Cola did. Cola has an obligation. Yeah. yeah. I'm so sorry. They're, they're not all coming back. Okay. Well, we can give another minute, but I know we closed the other room. So. Okay. I can Where add them in snacks. Time. Where are my snacks, Ken? I need snacks <laughs> for this part. <laughs> I should have had a grow hub. Sorry. Right. <laughs> Jeremy. I think you're all set then if um, it's just the three of you, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ruth, I see Deborah on the call. Okay, thank you. Looks like we have 69 participants. Uh, so that's probably everybody, at least at this point. Um, again, uh, this is a great afternoon for us. Uh, I really enjoy hearing about the projects, appreciate the students' presentations, and they're willing to stand up here and take questions from the judges, uh, even on Zoom. It's a little different in a, in a room full of people, but it's challenging either way. Um, so thanks for all the work you've done. I want to thank the judges again, Deborah Jackson and Mark Whitley, Cola Akindeli and Jeremy Hitchcock, and of course, President Lishan. Uh Not everybody's available to continue with us at this point in the day, so I'm going to let President Leshen take it from here. Thanks. I do see Mark here, though. So Ruth, if you could throw him on the on the screen here with us too, that'd be great. We did just have a wonderful conversation. You all had us all uh, all excited about the work that you've accomplished. So just speaking to the teams, I want to say again, congratulations to all five teams. Really, it was it, it was a um, a good conversation about many strengths that each of you brought to the table. And as usual, the um, decision is a difficult one, and what I'm going to do is is give a little bit of feedback to each team, and um, these are not in any kind of particular order, except that the last one will be the one that, that we've selected as the winner. So um, I'm actually going to start with um, our London team, uh, the Lambeth team. We thought they did, they did great work. Congratulations. We, we loved especially the idea that you pivoted and, and narrowed your project so that you could uh, really you know, take on something where you could get to a result and, um, and make the impact during the, your relatively short stay in London. And um, we thought that showed a lot of, a lot of grit and determination and, and, um, and that your results were really data driven. We loved that as well. So let's give a big congratulations and Zoom claps to our Lambeth team. Yes, well done. So I think what I'm gonna do is walk through all five teams and then we'll do photos. Normally, if we were all together, you'd come up now and we do photos, but we'll do photos. So hang out, um, so well done. Um, 
Next, uh, I want to talk to our uh, brewery waste team in Albania, who uh, who had to be first out of the gate with us here today and figure out all the Zoom kinks. So thank you for that. Um, really, just we're very impressed with the breadth of the foundational research you did, all of the different um, organizations that you spoke to, both here in the U.S. and in Albania, and and you know working on a problem that really is at the intersection of of technology and the regulatory environment and human behavior. It was a very complex challenge, we thought. And we thought you actually gained a really strong understanding of the issue and made some, some great recommendations. And we especially liked the part where you were able to really unpack cases where um, doing what was right for the environment could be could be a real win for them from a business perspective as well. And so you re this idea of win-win and environmental impact, I think, is a really powerful one. So we, we appreciated those um, aspects of your recommendations. So to our brewery race, waste in Albania team, congratulations. Zoom back with you. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Um, Next, let's talk to the Jazz History Database team. Oh my gosh, what an incredible uh, impact that you had with your project. We were um, incredibly impressed with your passion around the work and also the amount that you were able to, to accomplish. You really changed the game for, for this database project and took it from something that was at real risk of, of potentially disappearing as Professor Falco is transitioning to something that is has not only the opportunity to endure, but to really scale and expand. And, and so, and it was especially great hearing from Jeremy about how he worked it, on it all those years ago and to see it really positioned now strongly for the future was incredibly inspiring. And we're really, really proud of the work you did. And uh, Mark recommends that you go check out the New Orleans Jazz Fest um, when that's back up and running and, and not only enjoy the jazz yourselves, but maybe think of it as a platform to uh, get more people engaged with the uh, Jazz History Database. So congratulations to Team Jazz History. Well done, well done. Okay, so now we're down to two, two more left. And um, the one I want to speak to next is uh, the Monte Verde Costa Rica team. So great presentation, first of all. Your presentation was extremely compelling and we, we very much enjoyed it. And I have to say, I'm incredibly impressed about just the amount of work that you got done. You created an app, you had infographics, you created the, the CAD plan for the warehouses and, and all of the backup material there. And, and importantly, you, you did all this work to help meet what was really a critical need in this community. And, and you did it in a way that really should be implementable in the long run in that community. So um, it was a great community impact. It's clear that you loved your time there and uh, just really proud of the work that you were able to do. And, uh, and congratulations to you, Team uh, Costa Rica, Monte Verde, way to go. And you get extra points again for the geologic features on your slides. Um, and so that brings us to uh, the winner this year is the Spotschlager Camp team from Albania. Uh, huge congratulations, Michael, Leo, Elizabeth, and I know Zeta isn't with us, but um, well done. We're, uh, we were incredibly moved by the work that you did, and, and we do really feel like it personifies what the IQP is all about. It had strong technology pieces to it and even stronger human pieces to it, and you were able to bring those together in a way that was very, very powerful. And it's clear that the work had an impact on you all personally as well, which we always love to see. And our interaction during the Q&A especially was, um, was very moving to all of us. And uh, you made at least a couple of us cry with a little bit of your presentation. So well done. Um, congratulations to our winning team um, from the, with their work in Albania at the Spotch Labor Camp. So let's give a big round of congratulations to them. 
Well done. Uh, again, well done, everyone. I'm uh, always, I love doing this on a Friday afternoon because it just makes my whole weekend great when I think back on how inspired I am by the work that you all have done. And, and it's a lot of work. And then to come back, you know, in some cases more than a year later and be picking it back up again and presenting it, it's not easy to do. And so, and then having to do it over Zoom makes it that much more challenging. But to all the parents out there, I hope you're as proud of your students as we are, and especially to the advisors. Thank you for your support of the learning process for our students here. Um, and let's figure out how we take some, some pictures. Uh, and we got the Spotch team here. Oh, perfect. And the Just judges. One moment. We'll have and, the advisors come on as well. The advisors class. are coming in too. Um, there's Professor Hirsch. Good to see you, Bob. And Professor Kanicki is in the screen, not quite yet. I see him, but he's not on the screen. Hi, Bob. Oh, my goodness. So nice to see you. Oh, is he in here? Bob Kanicki. He is. Yes, he is. <laughs> I got Bob. I got Bob Hirsch. We have Bob Hirsch. Bob Kanicki. I'm trying there. to find Bob Kanicki. I lost him again. Oh, here we go. Oh. Sorry. Technology problems. Okay. You're with me. Thanks. We don't judge Deborah. Dean Deborah has to leave. So uh, thanks so much for being a part of this today, Deborah. I don't know where Bob went. <laughs> I know he's in here. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Just bear with me. Oh, boy. Oh, there you are. Sorry. There we go. Yeah. There's the team. Excellent. So do you have your awards, everybody, if you'd like to hold up your awards? Oh, yay. That's right. We already no, no, oh, I'm not the sure background. I don't think they work with the background. <laughs> I don't want to you want to hold it up and, and see if we can hold them kind of close? Everybody can see your awards at least. Well, I want to see your faces too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Leo got it to work a little bit. There we go. There you go, Leo's. Hey, hey look at that. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, nice, Michael. Excellent. All right. Excellent. Congratulations, Great everybody. Smile. Excellent. Congrats. Yay. Yay. I'll drink a toast to y'all later. <laughs> if we were all together, I'd be having a toast to you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Want to call up another team, Lori? I need to um, one, Lori. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thanks, much. Mark. Take care. So, so we can ask um, the next team to turn on their cameras, and then we can spotlight all of them. Sure. Should we have the other Albania team? Absolutely. So Bob and uh, Bob and Bob here. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Bob Kinnicky, how are you? Doing fine. Good. It's really nice to see you. Working on Bucharest as we speak. Bucharest. Oh, awesome. And, uh, is always so fascinating. I always love our teams from there. And they always have great projects. Okay, so Okay, and then how many people we have? I think I have three people. Am I missing somebody? There's four four team four team members, Ruth. Yeah, I'm trying to find the last one. Um Sarah, Maria, Katie, and Griffin. So I think it's Griffin. Oh, there you are. Everybody moves on the screen and then I can't find you all. There we go. Oh, Michael needs to. Is that right? Cameras. Yeah, you need to turn on your camera, Michael and Elizabeth. Please. And Leo. There we go. So. That was from the last. Oh, hold on. That was the last team. group. Yeah. Sorry, not Elizabeth. <laughs> so who is it? All the ones from the Maybe. product center. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Maria was from the Maybe previous. And Maria and Griffin. I got. Oh, 
Um, Hirsch, is that Albania behind you there? It is Albania behind me, but it's in the other part of the country. It's not near Scotch. It's in the southern part called Giro Castor, which is a UNESCO heritage site. Beautiful, beautiful place. It just looks like an incredible place. I really want to go. Well, hopefully next uh, next fall. There you go. Let's do it. I know. I think after COVID is over, I'm going to just spend all year running around in project centers. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. While we're waiting, I could take us on a virtual tour of another city. Mm -hmm. I could find my. Uh... I'm hoping that John can get the picture, but if everybody would like to hold up their certificates, if you have them. We don't have everybody yet, Ruth. We don't? Um, you have the three from the old. We still have Elizabeth and Leo from the last team. Michael. Uh, Michael. Yeah. We need Katie, Sarah, Marissa, and Griffin. There's Katie. All right. Sorry. Oh, it's hard. I, I technically don't. challenged right now. Do we have somebody from IT who can help? Um. So I think they just need to turn off their cameras, the other folks that are in the picture. No, you have everybody right now, right? Yeah, it's not. It's just showing you actually right now. Um, the people are on the on the speaker view, but they're not in the um, main screen. Does that work? Gallery view? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I'm just being confused at this point because my screen shows me everybody. Yeah. Um, it's just very difficult to try and try and do it as individual groups. So if, if we um, if we don't have IT help, maybe we can just try to figure out, Kent, if there's a time we can ask people to come to campus and we could just very quickly and safely do some group photos or something. We could just join another Zoom at another time. That probably would work out better. That could work too. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. It's just shown me everybody. So at this point, I don't know how to get rid of the extra people. <laughs> um, I, th I think, well, I shouldn't say it like that. I'm sorry. No, okay. <laughs> Actually, the, the, um, the, uh, the, the listing on YouTube just shows four people. So I actually wonder if we do have um, just who we need on this for the picture. Um, in the chat, I'm getting a little bit of advice, Ruth, about right-clicking um, and to hide non-video participants. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. There we go. That's awesome. If you want to bring up your certificates. Well, I haven't brought in the students yeah, as if they were panelists or, or the judges. At least on my screen, I have everybody lined up at the top of the screen and I have the WPI awards logo in the middle and that's it. I have a different screen. I have everybody. Okay. Then you can take a picture. <laughs> See if we've got it. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Okay, you want to call forward another team? I don't know if it matters. How about the Costa Rica team with Alejandra, Dante, Nancy, and James?
Uh, I can't show my video again. Alejandra, you got it. <laughs> yeah, it, it arrived uh, like an hour ago. We got lucky. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Excellent. Um, can you? And uh, so we just need show my video. the two advisors are. Oh. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. But Creighton and William San Martin, if he's here. What happened to Creighton? Here we go. Creighton. There he is. Uh, Ruth, can you uh, let me uh, or uh, share my video? Alejandra. Have Nancy share her video. Nancy. OK, yeah. sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. So many people, everybody moves around on my list, so it's hard to get to everybody, sorry. There she is. All right. Well done, folks. We have everybody? Yep. Tell me. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. And we have Creighton. I don't think uh, William was able to join us. Congratulations, everybody. Wonderful. Okay. We'll keep going here. Um, Jazz database. That's not quite so many people. So. Michael, <laughs> Lucas, and Keith Ziza, who I think is here. Nice. Thanks for the follow today, Mike, too. <laughs> Chris, you might have to disable your background. Yeah, it's uh, it's too good. It knows, it knows the award isn't part of my face. Oh, That's look at that. Here, give me a second. <laughs> oh, look at that. I think we just did it. Oh, yeah. hold on. We remove Alejandra. Perfect. Excellent. Wonderful. You want to hold up your uh, award? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't mind me back in here. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That's a cute spot. Great. Thank you, everyone. Okay, there's only one. Hey. Yes. The team Ryan, Paul, Matthew, and Brendan. And John Orr and Paul Marone. It won't let me start my video. Yeah, one moment, Paul. That's John. Oh, sorry, John. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. I would have dressed up if I knew there were photos. That's okay. <laughs> Hi, Ryan. Hi, Brendan. Hi, Paul. Hi, Professor Orr. Good to see you. Great job. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, I am missing Paul Marone as well. Hold on. Hi, Matt. Hi, Professor. How are you doing? One moment. Doing very well. Good job. Yeah. Nice to see you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you.
Thank you for the vaccination. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> My nice first time on campus you. in over a year. Oh, good. Oh. Well, I'm so glad that's a good reason to come. That's great. Oh, I, I think we're missing Paul Marone. I don't see him listed. Okay. I thought he was in here, but sorry about that. Congratulations, everybody. <laughs> Yay. Yay. That's wonderful. Awesome. Congrats. Thank you. Yay. Especially. Do we have one more? No, I think that's we did the Spock one first. Yeah. All right. Well, gosh, everyone did such a great job. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. That concludes the afternoon. I'm very sorry we are not hosting you in Higgins' house for a reception right now. Uh, but maybe we can make that up at some point before the semester ends. I vote for that. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Congrats again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.